Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Donna Jacobs, Senior Vice President at the University of Maryland Medical System. I want to welcome you all here today for our program, Not All Wounds Are Visible, a community conversation. We're speaking today about addiction and substance abuse. Perhaps many of you were here in June when we did a day-long program about many or all of the issues in mental health and substance abuse. The response to that day was so great and overwhelming that we've decided on every six-month basis to talk about the issues one by one. And today is the first one we will talk about, again, addiction and substance abuse. You have in your program, you have in your folders the program for the day. We have several topics. One is what's addiction and substance abuse? And then what are the non-opioid addictions? That'll be followed by the opioid epidemic. What is recovery? And then we have a special presentation from one of our physicians who is the child of two addicted parents. We'll talk about his journeys and his struggles and his triumph. I'm going to introduce Dr. Brad Schwartz to you now. He's going to speak about addiction and substance abuse and particularly about non-opioid addictions. Dr. Schwartz is a um, professor at the University of Maryland in the School of Medicine in emergency medicine, and he currently works down at the UM Capital Regional Health uh, System in Prince George's County. Both he and Dr. Chris Welsh, who is also at the University of Maryland Medical System in Psychiatry, will then take questions following this opening presentation. Uh, so my name is uh, Dr. Brad Schwartz. I work over at Prince George Hospital Center, and uh, I'm an emergency medicine physician. Um, so I chose to talk about uh, non-opiate addictions today. Um, a couple non-mainstream medications that you'll hear a lot about over in the news, synthetic cannabinoids, which is called synthetic marijuana, and bath salts, not what you pour over into your tub. Um, and so the reason that I thought about to talk about these were twofold. One. These are, just like our title over here, not all wounds are visible, not all drugs are visible either. Uh, these are things that we really have a tough time testing for. Um, and in addition, not all addictions are opiate uh, dependent. Um, so as Dr. Walsh did a great job talking about, uh, most dependence and substance abuse comes down to stimulating your um, dopamine receptors. Um, but not all medications do that just directly. And a lot of people have addictions to these medications, which are or rather these drugs, which are just coming out uh, more recently. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so synthetic cannabinoids, um, they're called, you know, you'll see them, K2, Spice. Um, they're originally devised by a very well-meaning chemist over in the 90s um, for medical research. And unfortunately, um, they got changed over into something else. Um, so as of five, Five years ago, mainly, 10 years ago, you would see these over in head shops, um, over in gas stations. Um, they're labeled for not for human consumption, but obviously people were consuming them a lot. And they're becoming a significant problem because unlike marijuana, which stimulates mostly the cannabinoid receptor CB1, which is over in the brain, causes um, some relaxation, inhibition effects, um, and CB2 receptors, which are kind of less important, which have some immune uh, modulation response over in the body, um, they stimulate the same receptor, but they just did it so much more so. They have much more tight uh, binding affinity over for this receptor. And so what they caused, we didn't know. Um, so what we would see patients presenting to over in the emergency department would be patients coming all the way in from agitation, seizures, um, fighting, to the flip side of that, people very sedated, um, comatose, um, both causing problems. So agitation, you know, requiring police staff, being physically assaulting people, all the way to the flip side over people being so sedated where they couldn't breathe on their own and recover breathing, breathing too. And we'd have outbreaks of these and they would, you know, the, usually the state board would let you know um, that was a significant health problem. There's an outbreak of a certain batch. Um, uh, depending on where they were devised over from a chemist in an outside country who devised this formula that they had no idea what it did, but then they released it over to the public. Um, so here's sort of a timeline about what happened over maybe the last 10 years. 
Um, it really became prominent over, we can bl blame everything over on the UK to start off with. Um, and then over in 2010, you can see it really started to become a problem and the DEA started to use emergency powers to ban synthetic marijuana. Um, and they started to play a cat and mouse game where they could only ban a uh, compound if they knew the chemical structure. They would ban the chemical structure and then the chemist over in China or the UK or here would change the chemical structure and then they would need six months more to figure out what the chemical structure was and then ban that too. So obviously that was a problem. And then somewhere around 2012, they said, we're just gonna ban these compounds based on what they cost rather than what they look like. Um, and as legislation um, got better and police enforcement has gotten better, these compounds are a lot more rare um, over in the public. You really don't see them very much over in gas stations and head shops uh, because people end up well, doing jail time for distribution or considerable fines. Um, so who's using it? Um, so there's an interesting um, poll that they do over in uh, University of Michigan. It's called Monitoring the Future Study. Uh, so every year they'll poll the high school students to see what their drugs of abuse um, are. And as you can see, the most common is marijuana, um, followed by number two over, in, and this is in 2012 when they took this poll, uh, was synthetic marijuana. So at that time, 8% of, uh, of students were reporting that they had to le at least use this once, if not more. And so we can see a trend change over in 2016, um, where over here now you can see that marijuana is still about the same, and then over now dropping down to about 4% of synthetic marijuanas, or synthetic cannabinoids, rather. And then over prescription medications, surprisingly, amphetamines is number one, and opiates are number three. Um, so what does this mean? Well, it just shows a trend change. Um, you know, I can hypothesize that this is due to the fact that legislation and police enforcement got a lot better over for synthetic cannabinoids, which is absolutely a good thing. Um, and perhaps that um, marijuana is becoming legalized in more states is becoming more accessible. Um, so we talked a little bit about this, um, synthetic cannabinoid effects, um, which range from the worst being agitation seizures all the way to being comatose. Um, and obviously that can be a problem. And what we found over in the literature as well is that people can become just like opiates addicted to this medication. Um, if they stop taking it, they develop um, mood swings, trouble sleeping, um, and they can even develop tremors. Um, and so one of the reasons I bring this to your attention is so we know a little bit more about some atypical uh, drugs that are being abused and also realize that not everything is an opiate that, once again, that can develop uh, dependency and abuse. Another uh, medication that you'll hear a lot about over in the news is uh, caffeinones, which are called bath salts. Now they're marketed over as bath salts, but obviously you're not pouring these over into your tub. Um, and these are a lot of the scary stories you'd hear over in the news about people attacking each other, biting each other's face, zombie-like activity, really scary stuff. Um, and so interestingly, these medications were synthesized from a stimulant found in the cat plant. Um, if anybody saw the war movie Black Hawk Down, um, that was what the Somalians were chewing when they um, staged the assault over in um, the afternoon time. And they work as a stimulant, um, and they're often a replacement for ecstasy or cocaine. It can be used kind of in any format, and um, the same, well, not the same, but similar to synthetic cannabinoids, it's addictive and can cause withdrawals, depression, tremors, trouble sleeping. Um, so these are some atypical drugs. Now, additional things that Dr. Welsh talked about that can also cause substance abuse and dependency absolutely cocaine. Um, when we talk about opiates, I should say that, you know, these are the medications that, like prescription medications, we talk about Vicodin, Oxycodone, these include heroin, and then the other medications that you'll hear about frequently, it's something called fentanyl, which is often marketed over on the street, and now people are over mixing over into drugs as well. Um, so, despite talking about this, the, the, and talking about the non-opiate drugs, the majority of mortality in the U.S. is due to overdose from opiate medications. And Dr. Ramesh is going to do uh, a longer talk over about this, but just to kind of transition into this for a second. Um, if you look at U.S. drug deaths over the last few years, over the last 10 to 15 years, you can see a growing uptrend in opiate deaths. And 64,000 sounds like a big number, and it is. Um, but to put it into context, um, over in the Vietnam War, 58,000 people died. So we're already exceeding that in one year. And the uh, worst year for motor vehicle accidents, I believe, was 1972. 
um, and around 42,000 people died. So every year more people are dying from opiates than they are dying from car accidents. Um, and this is just looking over at drugs involved in over, uh, overdoses, trying to develop them over into class. And you can see that the, the top three over here being synthetic opiates, heroin, and natural and semi-synthetic opiates with cocaine and methamphetamine being lower or down the list. Um, so that's not to say that all our efforts need to be devoted to opiates, but this is definitely becoming an epidemic um, and something that we need to pay more attention to um, and hopefully bring these numbers down. And that's all. Thank you. Um, we have a microphone here. You can consider the questions you want, and as well, I'm keeping my eye on the iPad. Come up to the microphone so we can hear you. It's a microphone in the center. No, we've got people at other satellites who want to hear your question, too. And so we need you to come up. And there's Dr. Welsh. Invite him up to the front. So let me say this before we start. We want to really try to get in as many questions as we can, questions and answers, because this is a community conversation. And remember, we've got four other sites where we're coming, getting questions from. So please try to keep your questions succinct so we can get through. Real quick, two questions. Oh. One is the, Uh, well, so for, again, it depends on the person, and sometimes it depends on the drug. Um, but for most people, the, eventually, the brain function will get back to normal. But it, the Over idea time. is that it can take a long time. Over time. Okay, and the other one was, I'm looking at the numbers, and I'm wondering, as a person born and born through uh, seeing drugs devastate the community in the 60s and 70s, what's that number relative to that? When, when the 60s and came and 70s. through and destroyed communities in the... I can't give you a number for that, um, but you can see... I mean, is it higher? What do we... It's, it's higher now than it was then. You think then. so? Yeah. And, that, and I think the big difference now here in Maryland and really across the country is that back in the 60s and 70s, heroin was almost all Urban. in the inner cities right. and almost all minorities. Right. And a lot of people are like, well, why are we now caring that it's hitting yeah, middle class I'll, white? And that's yeah. a whole other discussion. Yeah, but, but it definitely, the, a big thing over the last 10 or so years is how it's, it's okay. and, and we've had a lot of heroin even in, you know, I have a newspaper from the mid, I think it was 97 about, you know, heroin in Carroll County. And so Maryland, we've actually had more in the suburbs for longer than most areas of the country. But for a lot of like Appalachia, and, right. you know, New England, there are areas of the country that really didn't have it until right. this last decade. And that's a big difference now with the epidemic now compared to the 60s and 70s. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I first want to thank the University of Maryland Medical System, the University of Maryland Wall, for doing this. This is cool and stuff. My question is about medication assisted treatment. There is a, a debate going in the court system and between doctors in Harvard County where I come from, that one you can work in is nothing about substituting one opioid for another, one high for another, therefore it should be prescribed by docs, because obviously the other side of the equation, you can work in, this is a different kind of high, it is effective, it does help people. Where do you all come down on the medical assisted treatment question like that? Is people working in a bad replacement or a good treatment? 
Um, so we can talk about it some, but I think one of the later speakers is also talking about treatment. So, um, but so this this comes up all the time. This question and. So the vast, vast majority of people that take buprenorphine, there's also methadone um, that, that is used. The vast majority of people, when they're taking it correctly, are not getting a high from it. Um, buprenorphine, actually, it's, it only works partially at the, the receptors in our brain where opiates work. Um, so most people, when they take that, they don't feel a high at all. So what it's doing is helping some of those brain changes, which with opiates, those changes can, can take many, many years. There are people that when they've used opiates chronically, it, it affects their pain threshold. They're always more sensitive to pain after that. So especially with opiates, um, those medications like methadone and buprenorphine can really be helpful for people. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that feel you're just replacing one for the other, but, but going back to the, the first thing that I talked about, the difference between being physically dependent and addiction. The vast majority of people when they're taking methadone and buprenorphine, they are physically dependent, so if they stop it, they'll go through withdrawal, but they're not addicted to it. it it's not affecting their life in the negative way that the heroin or whatever opiate they were misusing was. So, um, the um, yeah, um, so, um, yeah, um, I, I want to know what is the how the biosis? You know what I'm saying? Right? And the, um, the leukeosis? No, sorry, those are, those are some medical terms I left over. Yes, there. what is that? Those just have to do with basically what your pupils are doing uh, when you're taking the medications, if they get dilated or restricted. And then once, it, if your pupils get dilated or if they get uh, constricted um, with the medication, and then also one has to do with, um, I believe it's about like, with your white blood cells um, that they get elevated during, um, during that. Um, yeah. Okay, my next question is for K2, is there um, medication besides um, counseling therapy as far as talk therapy, is there a medication Detox or something for kids? Currently, no. Nah, I'm not aware of anything. I'm not sure. Yeah. So that, when yeah. the clients that are, when you have someone that comes in with K2, especially the young people that are coming in with K2 addiction, they're um, getting into health therapy, but the, med the medication they're getting is um, amphetamines or something else that's not really helping them either. So what would be the treatment for that? Just a recent that we're realizing that just like many other medications, if you're on something chronically, that you can develop a, um, a you know, abuse habit and addiction to it, and even a dependency, which you can see when people start to get some withdrawal symptoms. Um, so I think that's an interesting area. We'll see if it continues. Hopefully the abuse will settle off so we won't need to, to devise as much strategies towards um, people rehabilitating from it. But currently there's not much. I, I agree with you. And well, I'll just to add to that, that part of the problem with the synthetic cannabinoids like that is that people can more easily get psychotic, like hear voices, and, and sometimes that doesn't get better right away. So part of the therapy and the, the ongoing treatment is to try and tease out, is this something that was just from the medicine, or is this somebody that might have you know, developed some kind of a problem? So, so part of it is keeping someone engaged in treatment, and so that you can just see over time how they do and if they're getting better or not. So you're suggesting that the therapy for K2 would be mental health and substance abuse combined together, together. Yeah, especially if the person got psychotic from the K2 use, which which happens a lot more than it does than we see like with plain marijuana or things like that. Thank you. I have a question here from one of the satellite locations before you start. And it's what percentage of the patients that are using these drugs also have a diagnosed mental illness? Um, so we don't really know, but pretty much every study shows that if somebody has a substance use problem, they're much more likely to have another mental illness and vice versa. So um, 
but the, the numbers vary all over the place, and by diagnosis, people with schizophrenia, um, more than 50% will often have substance abuse problems, PTSD, 50, 60, 70%, so it really depends on the diagnosis, but probably in general, you're talking at least 30 to 50%. We do have a, some information based on research that we did here at the University of Maryland Medical System, which is related, and that is for a sample size out of West Baltimore, people with chronic disease or several chronic diseases, three, four, five, six chronic diseases in some instances, 91% of the sample that we looked at also had either mental health or substance abuse or both. 91%, which makes getting treatment that much more difficult for that somatic or medical condition. So it is problem. And also important that when you're getting substance abuse treatment that people are also looking at your mental health and vice versa, that just to do one or the other for many people isn't enough. That question was from Charles Regan. Yes, ma'am. Thank you both for the presentations. So I had a question about the, some statistics relating to the nature and uh, for Dr. Welch. Um, so I've always thought that it was, I know that the debate has kind of been out for a while, if I'm not mistaken. And so this, you're saying 60% genetic and 40% environmental. I was thinking that the, those statistics are like pretty close, so kind of similar to 50-50. And I was just wondering if you were, could kind of talk about like how recent those statistics were sort of calculated and kind of how they uh, came to those conclusions and if you could sort of speak to um, kind of whether those, uh, whether that kind of was, I don't know, close, whether you thought that was sort of close enough, to how close that was kind of, whether you thought that that could be close enough to, So, so those, those, that number comes from trying to synthesize all different substances. A lot of research has been done on alcohol, um, but other substances as well. And it's all different types of, like, truly genetic, you know, looking at different, you know, genes and things. But also, some countries do, a, like in Sweden, they have a really good registry of everyone that's born, and they've actually done studies with identical twins where one ends up staying with the family and one gets adopted out. So you have the same genetics but a different environment in which you're raised. And so all those different kind of studies, when you kind of pull them together, it shows that, um, you know, kind of in general, addiction's about 60% genetic. Um, but it's going to vary by substance. It varies because that environmental part you know, so right now, in different, you know, opiates go up and down, you know, over the, the decades in, in the U.S., say. Now, opiates are much more available. So that changes the environmental piece. So, um, so again, it, it, it varies somewhat. But I think it's, it makes sense because I definitely see patients who, you know, didn't have any parents with addiction, and then I've also seen young people who had a lot of addiction in their family, and for, you know, whatever reasons, they do not develop addiction. So, so that's, it's just important to remember that it's not like some things where you really are pretty, if your parents have it, you're pretty much definitely going to inherit it. Um, it's just important that we recognize that people inherit a, you know, a piece of, you know, that makes it more likely for them but they're definitely not going to inherit it, you know, definitely as a disease the way that some diseases are. Yeah, and I guess why you're clapping, and again, I think later people are going to talk about prevention things, but that it makes it if you can identify higher risk people, and you don't just like give them a, you know, a 15 minute talk about it, but you really kind of intervene, and you know, the problem is a lot of the interventions that are necessary cost a lot of money and organization, and. But if you can do that and really work on the, the whole idea of resilience, so finding out 
you know, like the children of people with addiction, you know, working with their strengths and trying to help them so that they don't get sucked into it. But it, you know, it's good because the, the, a big piece of it, it's not genetic, means that you can do things like that and they can help someone not develop the disease. Yes, well, my question kind of tied into the previous question and the delivery you just gave, um, because I know that we invest a lot of money into intervention and efforts into intervention and treatment, but was just wondering if all those factors that you listed, what could we do on it as a preventive measure? day conference you could do, but um, because it's not, a, you know, it'd be nice if it was a simple thing. It's just, you know, having D.A.R.E. go in the school and give some talks. And that mostly affects the kids who are least at risk to begin with. So, so you can, you know, do things like trying to intervene with the kids at highest risk, but that, again, that's very cost, costly time and manpower. But the, even the bigger issues of, you know, what do we do to help West Baltimore, where, you know, so many people have the problem. It's great to open community centers and do different things, and that's going to help some people. But, but there need to be larger systemic changes to really kind of help with the prevention at its more of its core. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my question is pertaining to a, a female that is pregnant. So in the last 10 years, you see the, the old weights taking effect and how it's affecting the mother and the fetus. What is the challenge for the next 10 years? What substance do you see? Is it nicotine, heroin? What, what substance do you see in the future and currently that's going to keep rolling over? In general or with pregnant? Both. Okay. So pretty much the same. Unfortunately, answer. The opiate epidemic, I don't think, is going away soon, and I think we're still going to be struggling with this, I don't know how much in 10 years, but certainly for a number of years. Um, so, and that's going to affect women and pregnant women, as well as, and you know, we, we focus so much because this epidemic is so big now and so many people are dying from it. But, Alcohol, nicotine, cocaine is making a resurgence here in Maryland, um, but they're really important, and they're certainly important for pregnancy. The alcohol and nicotine especially are, are big issues that really have not gotten, they, they're not any better than they were. They're just kind of eclipsed now by the opiate epidemic. Hi, uh, thank you for being here today. My question relates also to the genetic or the generational as well as the environmental. So in, in, since we're treating and uh, approaching this as a disease, my question becomes, from the, from the environmental standpoint, I can understand, or my perception is that it's either peer pressure or there's a performance, a substitution, so to speak, for coping, for coping mechanisms in some respect. From the generational side, if when we look at this as a disease, are we saying that at some point, a person who's predisposed by genetics will start seeking out something to satisfy something in them? Or is it also a factor of the environmental where that, that actually triggers that? So hopefully I'm making that clear. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there may be a small percentage that whatever the genetic component uh, that they may start seeking, but probably more often it's just if it's available or you know, what we've seen in this, the most recent piece of this epidemic is people who have an injury and they get put on a pain medicine and some people hate morphine. It makes them sick and they don't want to take any more than absolutely necessary. Someone else who's kind of genetically predisposed, they take it and it's helping their pain, but it's also triggering that, that part of their brain. So, so it's probably more often that you're more prone to when it comes your way in your environment for different reasons. But there may be some people that are actually, 
there's something that, that, that kind of feels missing and they actually start seeking you know, other things to kind of fill that void. Just to perhaps transition into one further comment with that. So some people are worried about should we not be prescribing pain medications up front to people? And does that increase your likelihood to become dependent if you're first introduced to it? Um, a lot of the literature shows that slightly, but you, it's more you develop a dependency when you have longer term use. Um, so there's been a lot of questions about, you know, as doctors, are we over, -pre over prescribing pain medication? Um, and, you know, a lot of the moves over in the 90s, um, which I'm sure Dr. Ramesh will talk about, um, about a push towards getting pe people to pain free. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of these answers are uh, not just medical, um, but also cultural. Um, and that's something that we're going to struggle with as a society to figure out, um, as well as, you know, physicians um, as a culture all together to figure out, you know, where does our happy place stand in treating people for pain, but not over treating people for pain. Let's thank Dr. Welsh and Dr. <laughs> Schwartz for their presentation. Uh, as we welcome Dr. Ramesh to come forward, let me just uh, make a couple of comments. We're now going to speak about the opioid epidemic in particular. Someone asked about the numbers. Where are the numbers? There was an increase of 66% in, opio in opioid and uh, addiction deaths in Maryland in 2016 over 2015 to a total of 2,000 deaths. So you can understand the magnitude of the explosion. And let me also comment. Many Almost all of the hospitals in Baltimore City are right now engaged in doing a community health survey. And as part of that, we surveyed about 4,700 people in Baltimore City and asked them, what's the number one health problem that you or your family struggle with? And the answer was addiction and substance abuse this year. Three years ago, that wasn't the answer. The answer was cardiac uh, issues, diabetes, et cetera. So you can see that just in that short time frame, we've got a changed focus. All right, Dr. Ramesh is the Department Chair of Psychiatry at the University of Maryland uh, Capital Region Health, serving both the Prince George's Hospital and Laurel Hospital, and welcome. Okay, um, I think this is the topic of the hour. Um, I'll try to address, there was a lot of interesting questions there. I'll try to address some of the questions in my presentation also. I have a lot of slides. Some of them were covered in the previous topic, so I'll skip some of those, and I'll go a little fast and make sure that there's enough time for questions from you all. So first, opioids. What are these? Opioids are drugs. They are derived from the opium, the natural opium, the seeds. The natural derivatives are the morphine and the codeine. The semi-synthetic derivatives are the oxycodone, hydrocodone. The fully synthetic drugs are the fentanyl. Actually, they are more powerful than morphine. And the illicit drugs are the heroin. So when somebody talks about opiates, these are all the common drugs that they're talking about. So Dr. Welch did address the next thing, that opiates bind to receptors in the brain and the spinal cord, and that, that's how they relieve the pain but they also bind to the dopamine, they increase the release of the dopamine, causing a sense of euphoria or a high. So, so how did we get here? My talk, I'm going to divide into um, how we got to where we are right now, what's the current status, where are we, what is being done systemically, your question about what is being done systemically by the government and uh, the state legislatures and then a sm few slides on opiate addiction and treatment. So Dr. Schwartz did mention about this being a cultural thing. We did grow up in US, take for pain, take a, if you have a headache, take a Tylenol, if you have a fever, take a ibuprofen, whatnot. But these pain treatments were mostly restricted to acute pain and not chronic pain until 1930s or so. So what changed all this was a letter that's published in the famous journal, New England Journal of Medicine, that's considered the number one medical journal recognized by everybody. And the letter in 1970s 
that came from the Boston Medical Center, they did a case study analysis on 12,000 patients that were hospitalized in a controlled setting, and they found that opiate addiction was not a big issue. The letter states, we conclude that despite widespread use of narcotic drugs in hospitals, the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. So basically they said, we don't see much addiction in patients beyond, who are being treated on opiates. So this, was, this is what changed everything. Then <clears throat> the pain movement kind of gained more momentum. There were a lot of lobbying efforts. There were uh, American Pain Society, the American Academy of uh, Anesthesiologists, and then the pharmaceutical industry. So there are a lot of lobbying effects for relief of pain. And the cancer uh, treatment, um, people talked about using it in cancer, and there were a lot of research literature support to that, and then they talked about using it for other chronic pain. So in 1993, there was a famous article in the New York Times by a famous uh, psychiatrist um, talking about how the growing literature shows that these drugs can be used for a long time with few side effects and that addiction and abuse are not a problem. So then the push was to add the pain assessment as a fifth vital sign. We do the vital signs, the blood pressure, the pulse, and all those things. The fifth vital sign was supposed to be pain assessment. Of course, we want patients to be comfortable. We want them to not be hurting. So it was a big push. And anybody who says they have pain, they have to be medicated. I go to nursing homes. I see there, if a patient complains of pain and they are not medicated, the nursing home gets dinged for it. So the pain treatment was pushed. And, 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 and even if a patient is in mild pain, they, they were given a lot of pain medications. So during the next decade, as I said, the anesthesiologists and the pain people and then the pharmaceutical companies, they came out with a lot of drugs. If you see all those drugs, came between 1990 to 2000s. So, and if you see how much profit they made, so just I'll give, quote you a couple examples. Just in two years, Johnson Johnson made four billion in Duragesic patch. In 2015, Forbes released that OxyContin made 35 billion since 1995. In a span of 20 years, they made 35 billion profit. So there was a big market here, and there was a big push. So also, it was not just pharmaceutical industries. There were a lot of pain clinics. They called them as pill mills. And they sprung open everywhere. And uh, they were just easy to obtain. The patients had very easy access to get pain medications, prescription, prescription pain medications. So in DEA, uh, they released a report in 2004 where they said, the patients were sitting in a crowded waiting room for an hour. They were just examined in, in a very short period of time. They did not get much attention. And average, if you see there, they got three different opiate prescriptions, a muscle relaxant and an anti-anxiety drug after a short visit. So this is one of the slides to show how the pill mills were advertised. And you, if you have $75, you get a visit there. So then. The pill mills, actually, they were in Florida. For some reason, Florida was a state where this was very, very epidemic. That's how it started. In 2009, nine out of 10 counties were the top ranked uh, prescribing OxyContin uh, in the US. Nine out of the 10 counties were in Florida. And 98 out of the top 100 prescribing physicians were in Florida. The people who prescribed more prescriptions, the opiate prescriptions, 98 of them out of the 100 were in Florida. There were 1,500 pain clinics open during that same time. And there were 12,000 deaths between the periods 2003 to 2009. There were 12,000 deaths just in Florida. And for some reason, Florida was the considered to be the hub. Again, Baltimore here is also nationally ranked um, in terms of opiate use, uh, we are among the top 10 cities in US for opiate use. If you see the prescription rates, if you take a 10-year sample from 2000 to 2010, 
the prescription rate almost jumped more than double. It was 14.7 there. Sorry. Oops. Okay. Let me go back. It was 14.7 there and went to 32 in a, in a span of 10, to, uh, 10 years. This is 14.7 out of 100,000 population, 14.7 prescriptions. The cause for alarm, how did this all create an alarm? What happened? They looked at a lot of studies. DEA was monitoring, and they looked at a lot of studies. The prescription rate, as you see there, for each of the drugs, it jumped for morphine 100%, for hydromorphone 300%, for oxycodone, 346%. That's just out of, it's, 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 it's very high, within the span of 10 years, five years. Here, it's five years. And the other data, someone was asking about pregnancy. Here, in, within, uh, if you see, between 2003 to 2013, 2003, there are 5,000 births of babies that are born to opiate-dependent moms. But in 2013, there were 27,000, almost more than five times. So these were all the things that raised a red flag and caused alarm. So the epidemic today is, this is how many people are dying. From 2000 to 2015, there's um, 35 deaths, or 30, 35 almost, uh, from, from any opiate out of 100,000. How do I? put it in number, uh, this is all the stats I want you to look at. Two million people are addicted in 2016 alone. Two million people were addicted, out of which are, for each of the two million, there are 11.5 million people who are misusing the prescriptions, prescription pain medicines. Roughly half of heroin users start out from prescription pain medicines, and over 0.3% are using heroin in 2016, which is about 100,000 uh, people. The deaths, the reason they call this opiate epidemic is because of death rate. The, there's 200 deaths overall so far in US. And the death rates are climbing each year. 2015, it was 52,000. 2016, it's 64,000 last year. 64,000 people just like Dr. Schwartz was saying, to put it in context is that more people died from more than car accidents or in wars. Um, that's a lot of people dying. Daily death rate is like 90 people. More than 90 people are dying on a daily basis. As we talk, each day 90 people are dying from overdose. Some more stats. 78.5 billion per year is the economic burden to US. That includes the healthcare cost, lost productivity, addiction treatment, legal cost, and so on. One third of the people start um, misusing when they are prescribed for chronic pain, and you have the other data. I can go on giving data. The data are alarming, okay? So the prevalence is not just in US, it's worldwide. It's not only in uh, developed countries like Canada, Britain, Spain, Australia, but also in other countries like Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, China, it's, it's prevalent everywhere. It can become pandemic if it is not controlled soon. Talking about US, 80% of global supply is consumed in US. And if you want to look at US, which states are consuming more, West Virginia is number one. So when you, if you are a practitioner, if you are treating any patients here, you ask them where they're getting the drugs from, West Virginia. Number two, then followed by Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, and other uh, states. And if you look at the prevalence, it's mostly in, it started out in the 60s, 70s in the cities, but now it's mostly in the rural areas. It's among Caucasian patients. It's among working class patients. It's not in city, it's not now. City is there, but the prevalence high in the rural areas and among working class patients. Okay, now, my second part of the talk. What is being done? What's, what's the government doing? 2010, Fed started cracking down on the pharmacist prescribers. 2010, they passed the Act Take Back, our drug disposal programs, where the pharmacies are allowed to accept the excess supplies from the household and 
uh, long-term care facilities and things like that. 2016, the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy um, uh, described the extent of the problem and gave a uh, speech and a um, uh, uh, thing. In 2016, same year, Obama um, um, signed a Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act and allocated about several millions, I don't have the exact figure, several millions of dollars for research and treatment. In 2016, uh, Governor Hogan declared uh, uh, a state of emergency. In Maryland, 2,000 people died last year. Out of the 64,000, 2,000 died in Maryland. Maryland's a small state, and we can't have this many deaths in Maryland. And this year, uh, our President Trump declared on August 10th uh, national emergency. So what else is being done? Prescription drug monitoring program. It's a PDMP, we call it. It's now mandatory. Everyone has to sign. If the physician prescribers who don't sign into it, they don't get the controlled drug prescription license renewed. So all states are required to do this. And they, all the pharmacies are also required to be registered. They collect and distribute the data. And more states now are restricting the prescriptions to a maximum of seven days. Seven days is the maximum you could get the prescriptions. Maryland is a little different. I'll come to it next. Maryland is, again, they had to be registered by mid-2018. You have to query into this database. You have to look into the database before you write a new prescription for each patient. And for chronic prescriptions, you have to look into the database every 90 days, every three months. And you have to document why you are using it for long periods of time. You have to say the dosage is the least minimal dosage that you are using. You have to document a lot, and you have to substantiate proof of what you're doing and, and show evidence-based medicine, basically. So now, addiction. Now I am coming to the treatment side. So that's what's being done by the government to crack down on the use and to limit the prescriptions. So now talk about addictions. I'll skip this slide. I think Dr. Welsh covered this very well, the um, distinction between dependency and addiction. And he talked about tolerance and withdrawals. So I'm going to skip this slide. Um, I want to just mention this slide one thing alone. Naloxone, which is Narcan, is now available very easily you can get it if for targeted population. If you go into the emergency room and if they deem you as a high risk opiate user, they will give you naloxone um, 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 nasal spray or injections to take home. So just to prevent the death, because the key is you got to use it really quick before <coughs> you, you can, um, uh, you don't want to wait until the patient comes. So. The families are being educated on how to use it, and, and, and it's now available free of cost to eligible uh, uh, patients in the emergency room, and all the hospitals are now being um, equipped with this. So what are all the warning signs? They talked about, the previous two speakers talked about the withdrawal symptoms and things like that. Just on opiate, what are all the warning signs for opiate addiction, opiate use? They get a sense of elation, euphoria. Sometimes they can be confused, drowsy. They are not able to concentrate. Their appearance changes. They are more isolative. They are more secretive. Their pupils are constricted. This is what meiosis that uh, that speaker was referring to. If you see a pinpoint pupil, that's a classic sign of opiate overdose. And their breathing, breathing slows. They're, they are constipated. Just think. If they are high on opiates, their secretion all dries up. So you have urinary retention, you have constipation, you have blurred vision. So you have all those secretions dry up. And if, if you are withdrawing, it's the opposite. The other signs, they are doctor shopping, they have financial problems, they're dramatically changing moods, <coughs> social behavior changes. Now the withdrawal signs. As I said, there's more secretion. So there's diarrhea, there is vomiting, they're sweating, and they're irritable, uh, they have insomnia, their blood pressure pulse goes up. Um, so those are all the signs of someone is going through a withdrawal from opiate. This is specific for opiate. 
some treatments. Uh, there was a question about treatment with buprenorphine. Um, Dr. Welch addressed it. Um, it's a partial agonist. Yes, we started out using clonidine, which only treated the physical symptoms. It treated the high blood pressure, it treated the pulse rate, it treated the physical withdrawal symptoms. It didn't really treat the mental cravings and things like that. So then we started using methadone. Methadone was the gold standard treatment for a while uh, until people somewhat started using, abusing the methadone too. Uh, they found ways of abusing it. So then came, uh, also methadone was only available in the clinics and uh, you had to go daily or you'll only be getting a prescription maximum of three, three days to one week after you have been in the program for a long time. So it was not available easily for treatment. So then came buprenorphine, which is actually now the gold standard of treatment. As he said, unlike methadone, buprenorphine is a partial agonist. What that means, what the term means is, it doesn't give the full effect of the opiate stimulation. Agonist means stimulating. It's not stimulating the receptors fully, it's partially, and it partially blocks. The beauty is, if you try to take any other opiates on top of it, you go into withdrawal, because it's blocked all the opiate receptors in your brain, so you can't take any other opiates. So it curbs that. And to answer your question, why can't they abuse this, there is a ceiling effect with buprenorphine. You can abuse it to a little bit, but if you take more than a certain uh, dose range, 32 milligrams, then you don't get any more effects. It doesn't, it doesn't impair your functioning, it doesn't make, get you addicted like Dr. Welch said. It does make you dependent. And when you stop, you, don't, you do go into withdrawal symptoms. But it helps you be functional, helps you be productive, and helps keep you stay away from the opiate uh, drugs that you would otherwise be using. Then there's probifine is nothing but buprenorphine. Now for patients who need long treatment, it's an implant in the forearm or in the uh, arm here. It's a minor surgical procedure. You implant the drug there and stays in your system for six months or so. So you don't have to go to the office often to get the treatment. Now the buprenorphine is available as an outpatient treatment. It's not, you don't have to go to a clinic. It's always an outpatient treatment and a lot of prescribers are, are trained to use this. So a person who is licensed, you could get it. Internist, psychiatrist, anyone. Addiction is not only just medications. Medications are a tool, but the main treatment is counseling. Individual groups, NAA meetings. So you need to combine them with counseling for the best results. The treatment settings vary from outpatient to partial day intensive and to the inpatient treatment. I think I went over a little bit over my time. I'll stop here and uh, I'll take any questions. Coming forward to the mic, they are. <laughs> um, my, my question is, is there a research or study that is being done for the opiate uh, de um, detox? Because if, as a counselor, I understand the suboxone with the non noxalon and all that in it. And now the nectar, um, Narcan. If the Narcan brings them out of the, um, the overdose, right? Is there a research that's being done that instead of, okay, methadone and suboxone both has an opiate, a little bit of opiate for the receptors of our brain, correct? Correct. So is there research being done where there's medication for detox of opiate use without the opiate in it? Can you understand what I'm saying? Yes, there is research being done, but we don't have anything that's at least in a stage three or something. It's all in the preliminary stages. Uh, right now, the ones we have are the ones that contain the opiates or some form of stimulation of opiate receptors. We don't have anything that is not opiate that's at least in the last phase of trial. There is a lot of drugs that's being researched, but nothing promising yet. My next question is for, I thought the lady was gonna ask that question, for the women that are, are 
pregnant and um, opiate addicts that are trying to get off opiates and then having them on methadone for the babies. Isn't there a better, I, is there a better way besides giving them methadone? Because then their babies is already addicted to the heroin. And then when they come out, they're addicted to the methadone, which the babies have to be, I, if I'm not mistaken, they have to be on it for a while. So isn't that a predetermined effect of that child growing up being a heroin addict or an addict period? Uh, or a person that's use, use, misusing drugs, I forgot. Yeah. What methadone is a, is a methadone and Subutex without the naloxone is a preferred drug in the pregnant woman. Um, it's better to have them on these drugs rather than have them abuse the street drugs. If they can abstain from using the drugs without any treatment, if they are not heavy users and if they can uh, abstain with counseling alone, we try that first. We don't uh, go and uh, put everyone on um, um, buprenorphine or uh, methadone. But the focus is if they are heavy users and they cannot abstain, it's better to be on methadone, but the uh, child is getting some methadone, some opiate through the womb. Mm -hmm. The child will go through some withdrawal at the time when it was born, but the child doesn't have to be maintained or given any treatment. Um, the, the withdrawal symptoms in the child is usually more of an irritability and uh, crying for periods of time, and it should pass on its own. Dr. Ramish, thank you for your presentation. So you go back to your office, and you're there, and the phone rings. And hi, this is President Trump. I heard about your wonderful presentation today. What three things should I do to help improve this situation? And while you're thinking through that answer, the receptionist comes in and says, Dr. Governor Hogan on line two. And you put President Trump on hold, and Governor Hogan says, Dr. Ramish, I heard about your great presentation. What three things? As governor, should I do to make this problem better? What three things, and they could be the same, would you say to President Trump, and what three things would you say to Governor Hogan? Thank you. That's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, I, I think I need a little more time to, <laughs> to, to answer the question. But uh, things that come uh, right off my mind that, that I would recommend that they do is um, not only just curb the, uh, the prescription that's given, but more education, more, uh, more uh, system-wide uh, education and um, um, uh, dissemination of information about the risks of using opiate <coughs> and how uh, the, the, the it could be avoided, and uh, more education basically is what comes to mind, number one. Um, so when you educate them more, when you have an educated public, when you have an educated customer, uh, yeah, your job is half done. Um, go ahead. Two. Two, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, number two is to do more uh, m money into research and, 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 and come up with better treatments, uh, models, and, and, and drugs uh, to, to kind of target this uh, epidemic. Um, and number three, I would say, is to curb the availability. The deaths are happening because not because they are abusing heroin. All this heroin are laced with fentanyl, and fentanyl is cheap, and that's what's causing the death. So how do we limit the traffic? How do we limit the supplies? How do we curb the, the, the availability of these drugs uh, would be my other thing that I would think of. But if you give me time, I could come up with something better. We, we have a few questions from UM St. Joseph's Hospital, so I'll ask two and then we'll proceed here. Um, the first one is, how do we best reassure parents who have a child that has a medical condition and that they don't want the child to become addicted on pain medications, or there's a family history of addiction and they don't want the child to be addicted to pain medications? What, they, what do you say to them? And then are there any statistics to talk about this issue? I don't have the statistics, but definitely uh, talking to the child, um, um, and, and, and just like now in the high school, they talk about, they have the mandatory sex education kind of thing. If you talk to the child about the ill effects of opiates, and just drugs in general, not just opiates, drugs in general, share with them what's happening nationwide, and 
and, and, and be more of a friend if it's a high schooler and things like that, be more of a friend, uh, have an open conversation, be open to talking to them and not be punitive and, 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 and keep, be restrictive. But if you have open dialogue conversation and talk to them, I think we could address this problem better. Um, that goes without saying for any problem, any psychiatric problems too. If you talk to your kids and help educate them and be a friend and listen to them, I think we can address the problem better. But I don't have a statistic, sorry. Um, <laughs> it is highly prevalent in the adolescent, in the, in the high school, college kids, it is highly prevalent, the opioids. Second question is, are there any public training programs on Narcan use? There are a number of uh, CPR students who are asking how they can find them and how they can help. Okay. Um, I think the second person there is also part of my group in the, um, I think I met you there in the Maryland Hospital Administration. All the hospitals um, um, are, are now uh, really dealing with this issue, um, uh, talking about how to, uh, make the Narcan available and how to educate uh, the public. And, and there's been a lot of programs uh, they are discussing. Um, so th um, in the near future, in the near next few months, because there's a mandate now starting January 2018, all the uh, hospitals have to have a plan of how they are going to tackle this uh, opiate crisis and patients when they come into with opiate uh, problems, how they are going to tackle it. And one of the things is, the Narcan, how is it going to be uh, dispensed, how people are going to be educated. So there should be a lot of uh, uh, educational materials that should be coming out. Sure. Yes, ma'am. And if I missed something, you could add the second person in the line. <laughs> uh, good morning. Can you talk a little bit more about the implant? I've not heard of that before. I mean, what's the criteria? Who's using it? Um, is it covered by Medicaid? I mean, that's apparently very new. And I've so can you talk sure. a little bit more about sure. that? And also, if there are any clinics that are using it, can you share that information? Okay. Probufane <coughs> is a buprenorphine long-term, long-acting version. Um, it is recently approved. Um, I don't think it's covered by Medicaid. Um, it's an expensive drug. Um, it's, um, as I said, it can, it lasts for six months. It's done even by uh, private uh, um, uh, doctors in their clinics. It doesn't have to be a surgeon. Um, one can go through a training and, 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 and get the certification and do it. Um, so it's, I don't know in Baltimore, I am from the Montgomery, PG County area. I don't know here if University of Maryland has it. Maybe Dr. Weintraub, the next speaker, can answer that question. Um, but in uh, PG Ma Montgomery County, a lot of private practices <laughs> Uh, private practitioners, they do um, uh, um, give this uh, drug. And you can go to the uh, internet, uh, probe be fine. They have the pharmaceutical company has a website. And you can see who are all the doctors who are uh, certified to prescribe this drug. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. I, um, so regarding the question about getting certified or getting a certificate, to administer Narcan. Narcan. Yes. Um, so I took a class probably three years ago that was free in Baltimore City. I can get you the information on the break and perhaps you can uh, communicate it to those interested online uh, sure. and also to the class. I don't know the, the uh, it was through Baltimore City. Was Maybe. it the health department? <coughs> The health department, yeah. Something. Most of the like health that. departments mm -hmm. are doing it, yeah. And it's a two-year, it's uh, valid for two years. You get the, the card as well as um, a prescription written by a, a nurse practitioner um, for Narcan as well as um, some kind of kit, I think. You fill the prescription, and you don't have to be a health care provider. Right. Uh, you just go through the three-hour training. It's good for two years. And then you can refill it for free, we, or we get a renewed card by just contacting them. So I can get you the information. Great, so you can thank you. To everyone. So my question um, is oh, regarding, so it's regarding uh, whether you can kind of speak to uh, whether you think it'd be helpful, uh, there's sort of promise in um, reducing 
the stigma uh, and whether you could, you think that that might be helpful um, or I guess whether there's future promise um, as kind of the, the uh, opioid e epidemic, you know, increases and kind of whether you think that people coming out, particularly with uh, celebrities, um, and I'm thinking about this because there's this really great documentary, I don't know if you've seen it, Dr. Ramesh, but um, it's called The Anonymous People, and um, it sort of talks about how there was a lot of progress, like right before the, uh, in the 1990s, before the Bush administration, when they started really cracking down on, really when it became about cocaine and, you know, the, you know, there was no tolerance. But before this, a lot of people started coming out in uh, celebrities and talking about, you know, their addiction, particularly alcohol. And they saw like a, a lot of progress with, poli you know, politicians, particularly because politicians and, e and other, uh, and celebrities started coming out and talking about their problems. And there were some policies, a pretty big policy coming out um, that came out about, you know, um, uh, to help, you know, a lot of, for substance uh, abuse uh, programs, I think. And so, you know, with Marilyn Monroe and all, you know, Elvis and all those things, but even now, you know, with Whitney Houston and, you know, Heath Ledger and uh, Anna Nicole Smith and, you know, these recent things, I mean, these are, these are ways, uh, when people that come out, these are ways to kind of um, help people, but it's interesting that, you know, celebrities, sometimes celebrities, they're not, uh, they're sort of criticized. Um, like Whitney Houston, you know, she had all this addiction stuff in the media, but they never talked about, you know, who's getting her help? All they did was really criticize her and show all these pictures of her, you know, looking pretty terrible. So I think that there's, I guess my question is, you know, whether you think there's sort of promise or, or even maybe some potential um, for these in the future, something like what happened right before the 1990s, for this to, you know, to encourage people to not be at this point, this documentary was anonymous people. So for this to be an opportunity for people to maybe come out and be encouraged uh, and reduce the stigma, because I think there's promise in that for education and people to not be, you know, stigmatized or criticized. Thank you. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think that's a great idea. Um, especially when celebrities and politicians, they talk about it, it becomes a big a news media and more people watch it and you can get more uh, advertisement then um, uh, coming from them in terms of educating the public. And uh, there was, um, as she said, there's more criticism and that's why people don't come out, but if they do come out, it'll be a wonderful thing. And I, 100% agree, if you gave me a fourth choice, maybe that might have been a fourth size recommendation <laughs> we could make. Uh, I, agree. I agree. So here are the blessings of technology. I'm getting notes from people in our other locations. And one, one answer was this about the Narcan training. Every health department in the state is providing Narcan, tr Narcan training. So that answer goes out to, I think it was St. Joseph's or Southern Maryland for everyone. Okay, one other question, two other questions from St. Joseph, if you don't mind. What are the effects of opioids on young adults who have ADHD? Okay. Um, I don't know if there is any study um, um, that um, looking at specifically uh, patients with ADHD and opiates. Um, um, I could go and look, there probably is. Uh, but I, to my knowledge, um, if you are addicted to one substance, um, uh, and you are tend to get addicted to other drugs. Um, so if you're addicted to stimulants, the, the, the medications that are being used for ADHD, there's a likely chance that you could get addicted to the other drugs. <laughs> but people who are not addicted, but who have just ADHD, how likely are they to use opiates? Generally speaking, uh, the psychiatric uh, diagnosis, they all have comorbid conditions, we call it. So they do have generally other uh, diagnoses that go, there's not, there's very few patients who have just ADHD alone. They tend to have multiple other problems. And one of the common comorbid conditions is substance abuse. 
not just opiates, any drugs. Um, so the prevalence is definitely high. Um, I don't have the rate incidence, uh, but um, uh, I don't know of any particular study that's looking at ADHD and opiate. Um, one additional question from St. Joseph, and that is, what are the consequences of not checking the prescription dispensing monitoring program, and how is this going to be monitored and evaluated? So starting 2018, uh, the, the, the prescription drug monitoring program, if you don't check, I think you have the, uh, the consequences. Your CDS license, you could lose it. The controlled drug substance license, you could lose it. So you are required to check. And the monitoring agency, I think, is called CRISP. Um, it's a, a, a network that uh, connects the hospitals, outpatient mm -hmm. doctors, and everything. <coughs> so they monitor, and they have a grant from the uh, government uh, to do this. So uh, and uh, I think um, that's the way they monitor it. Very good. Good morning. I really don't have a question. I have part of a story of my life that I want to share if it's, if it's possible or I, I won't ask the question. Well, if it's brief, go right ahead. Okay. I mean, I've been clean 34 years. I used to use drugs for 10 years. When I first started getting clean, uh, I, tr I tried to get on the methadone program. They told me I didn't have enough tracks. Um, so I just put myself in the treatment. I don't think the programs, the methadone, broken between doesn't work if it's not in the person. If the person's not ready, you can give them all the drugs they want. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Me, it took me, I've been clean 34 years. That was November the 23rd. And I'm proud of myself. And I want to, I'm going to reach out to people. I want to get on programs, reach out to people. It can be done. It can be done without drugs. But it's got to be the mental part of you wanting to do this. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Dr. Ramesh, can you comment as well about peer recovery specialists? Yes, uh, that, that's, that's what I, I was going to say. Um, I really thank you for coming up to the podium and, and, and sharing your story. Uh, the best, the pro I have been to many hospitals and the programs, the best counselors are the ones who are recovered themselves and they come and talk about um, the, the, the drug use and how to stay off of them and it more effective when people like uh, um, uh, the gentleman here comes up and talks to other people and share their stories and talks about, hey, this is possible, you can do this. And, and the counselors, the peer reviews, peer reviewers, the counselors in these programs are the greatest counselors that I've ever seen. Is it, is it a website where you can look? Because I've been looking at physicians that are looking for a peer recovery person in an emergency ward, and I've been looking you have to take so many classes or classes, I don't know what's the website you have to go to to look for it. I don't know the website. Is, in, is anybody in the audience? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's peerrecovery.com. Okay, do you have the website for? Not yeah. Okay, you, you gave, okay, okay, great. Um, I wanted, I got two things. One is to piggyback on what the young lady said about the Noxalon training. Back then, they were given, the cars we were given, it was for us to train people into using it. Nowadays, because of the epidemic of heroin overdoses, there you don't have to do training anymore. You can go to the emergency room, and if you, especially people who are heroin users go to the emergency room, they will give them a packet of the Noxon to carry around. Or you can go to Central, I know this for sure, that the Central Library in Baltimore City on Cathedral Street does training. I don't know if the days are still the same, but I know it was Wednesdays and Thursdays in the evening. They also have free trainings. So you can get Noxalon in anywhere now because of the heroin epidemic. That was just piggyback on that. My question is, <laughs> it was a good question too. Thanks for sharing that information. <laughs> well, hold on and let the person oh, behind you ask a question. Yeah, if it comes back, great. It's happened to all of us. And if it hasn't happened to you because you're young, it's coming. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you for having this discussion. I'm, I'm a, uh, I work with youth, and from ages six to 18. My interest is, is what do we have for prevention? I mean, all this is all well and good. This costs a lot of money 
And you know, the, to me, it's about how do we get them to not start? And you know, um, what's out there now? What's, what's coming down the pike other than we got another treatment facility for $30,000 a month or whatever? You know? what, what are we doing about that to, to stop it now so that we don't devastate another whole three or four generations of kids? What are we doing with that? There is not much being done now. There is, there is some prevention classes, educations, and things that are being done in clinics as uh, where the treatments are happening, but a systemic nationwide or, 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 a, or a, on a bigger level, I have not heard of something that's being done or initiatives being taken. Maybe they are in the pipeline and they are not just heard of it, but I'm, I'm sure that it should be coming. Um, but I don't know of anything that's big, that, that at least in Maryland, that we can Thank recommend. You. Yeah, you have I said, I would encourage the gentleman to actually go to the, the Wilson Foundation website. Their whole priorities are youth substance abuse and prevention. The Wilson Foundation, they're based in California. They've done all kinds of pilot stuff. I'll be talking with you and your, your colleague later about that. But the Wilson Foundation has youth substance abuse. It's been their major effort for about two years. It's all evidence-based stuff. And of course, I'm sorry to jump in, but- No, 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 I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. Not enough, not right. like you said, but there are pockets of success. Yeah, there's a lot of pockets of, um, um, in the, all over the nation, but uh, nothing major on a big scale. But, but, but I'm glad you shared that. When the governor calls, you can tell me. <laughs> We're going to take these last two questions. OK. Is it a good idea for children, young adults and children, to be taught how to use Noxalon? to start it now, is that a good idea? And if it is, is there a pilot or training out for them? As far as I know, there is no training out for the children's adolescents, and I'm not sure if it is, maybe adolescents, maybe it's, it's a, um, um, uh, something that you should think about, but children, I don't think it's a good, great idea. But, but you got children whose parents are overdosing in front of them, what are yeah. they supposed to do? When, what, what, I, what I mean by children is a young children, Adolescents, I'm talking about teenagers and things like that, children, young children. Um, but I, it's, it's, it's something to think about. Um, um, something yeah. to raise with the health yeah. department. And my next Look. question is, heroin addicts, are, they're already addicted, right, okay? When they go to, for the core crime mental health, they're also prescribing addictive medication. Isn't there other medications that they can be taken besides um, like Vicodin and all that stuff that is addictive? for the mental health problem to keep, it's keep like it, the behavior is not changing. So if you take me from one addiction to another, my behavior is not changing. Isn't there another way or is there something being done where as though if I come in as a heroin addict and my, you're my mental health therapist and you get, is there other medications that it can be given without having addictive um, consequences? So there are non-opiate pain medicines for patients who need treatment, pain treatment, but the thing is they are not as Active. potent, so patients when they come for opiate medications, they usually have tried several of them, but yeah, considering the mental health, it's, it's, it's advisable for patients with or without mental health to not use those uh, medications, and doctors do try, and, and, and uh, there is a push to not use it now with all these regulations. So uh, there are non-opiate prescriptions available. Hi, thank you for the information that you presented. One of the challenges that I have is um, understanding where we start really um, dealing with the ethical and systemic issues around substance abuse, mental health, because when we come, one thing that becomes pretty apparent when we come to forums like this is that we have a lot of empirical evidence, but we don't necessarily have systems to support either prevention, preemption, or full recovery for many people. So where, where do we begin that conversation? Because there are ethical issues here, um, clearly, because we're dealing now with um, treating and helping individuals who, in many cases, trusted the medical professional that prescribed these medications, and now the onus is on 
this generation and the next generation and however <laughs> many generations it takes. So when do we start having that discussion up front instead of waiting for the train to run us over? And why aren't we having more of those discussions when we're doing the research and putting people in these situations? I agree. The ethical discussions has to be up front. It has to be in the start of the treatment or when they first encounter. And there is being more done now. And with the customers, clients being more educated, um, that's happening more and more. And they are being more aware. And there is actually more of a discussion these days than one of, OK, what do I do? And just tell me what do I need to do. There's more of a discussion between the patients, doctors, patients, treatment providers, and about these ethical discussions. There's actually a separate committee. If you go to this, all these conferences, the ASM and the APA and other things, there's separate um, uh, conference just to talk on these ethical issues with substance abuse in psychiatry, and how do we, how do we tackle all these ethical challenges? And there's a lot of them. Um, so there is more focus being done on that, and I think it's happening more and more. I, I agree it could happen, it should happen even more than what's happening now, but I think we are, we are getting there. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Ramesh for this very yeah. brilliant presentation. Thank you. Okay, because we've had a good robust conversation, we are a little bit behind, that's all right. We're gonna take maybe a seven minute break given that bio break or there's more food outside. As you do that, please do visit the vendors, uh, the, I call them service professionals who are outside. We have uh, AA of Baltimore, the Maryland Addiction Recovery Center, the Maryland Office of the Attorney General and the Health Education and Advocacy Unit, the UMS, University of Maryland Medical System Health Plans, the University of Maryland Midtown Behavioral, Behavioral Health Center, Recovery Centers of America, and then part of the uh, School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry. So take a moment and visit them. In all of our satellite locations, they too have service providers that are on hand. Come back in about seven minutes so we can resume this program. Thank you. All right, we're ready to resume, everyone. We're gonna pick up now with our next speaker who is gonna talk about recovery. This is Dr. Eric Weintraub. And I need to say a special thank you to him because he is the person within the University of Maryland system who helped us put today's program together and decide what we should do. I'm very grateful about that. And he's also made himself abundantly present when the media have asked to uh, hear what we're doing and help us communicate this out to the community. So very grateful to you for that. Dr. Weintraub is a board certified addiction psychiatrist here at the University of Maryland and he works right across the street at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Thank you. Thank you Donna and welcome everyone. So, so how do I do this? Just, okay. Um, I, what I wanted to do was uh, talk a little bit not only about recovery but about treatment um, as well because they're so interlinked and just bring up some topics that I think we need to discuss. I really heard some great questions the last uh, hour that I think bring up a lot of the issues uh, that we're dealing with. And, and I know Dr. Ramish talked about the opioid epidemic. Um, so my background is I've been working in the city of Baltimore for the last approximately 20 years working with people with opiate dependence and other substance abuse issues. And in the more recent uh, five years, I've been actually working in rural areas as well as the opioid epidemic has spread to other areas. Um, so before we get into recovery, I just wanted to talk about treatment because there's a couple, you know, there's many different uh, levels of care. If you look up, and I had a couple slides that are not included here that I may be able to get to you later, but ASAM has levels of care and different types of treatment that range from simple outpatient counseling to intensive medical detoxification. So one of the things that we're always doing with patients is trying to Discuss, uh, determine what level of care they need. Um, and I think one of the issues that we have, I think one of the gentlemen in the back who's working with the adolescents talked about the amount of money that we spend on inpatient treatment. Um, so I think what we really need to do is look at patients individually, make a determination of where they need to go 
for treatment and, and then send them to that appropriate uh, level of care. There's a tendency to oversell, I think, inpatient treatment as a cure-all, uh, and families hear that. Families have individuals or sons, daughters that are really struggling in life, and they're kind of sold, uh, I wouldn't say a bill of goods, but they're told, you send our kid, your kid with us for 30 days, everything's gonna be okay. They come out and things are not necessarily okay, and this pattern repeats itself over and over. There's lots of good outpatient treatment out there um, and people can do really well in, in outpatient treatment. So I think just as a clinicians and community members, you really need to question um, what your um, son or daughter or family member or friend is getting when they're referred for treatment. Um, other issues that have to do with treatment are there's different types of treatment. Like I said, there's counseling, there's 12 step programs, there's medication assisted treatment, there's family treatment. Many of our patients need dual diagnosis treatment because they've been traumatized, might have mental health disorders. We also know that many of our patients, especially those that are injection drug users and alcohol and people that have severe alcoholism have a lot of medical problems. So um, trying to co-link medical treatment with substance abuse treatment is, is really important. Um, one of the, and I think what we need to understand is that we need to meet patients where they are and not have them fit into what we think they need. Um, and I think that's really critically important. So these are all tools in our toolbox. So uh, medications can be helpful for some patients. 12-step programs can be helpful for some patients. So, and, and sometimes a con people need a combination of treatments. I think what we find most frustrating is that, pe that programs have a certain set of um, expectations for patients. Like you have to come to group three hours a day, four days a week, uh, and everybody needs to go to those groups or you can't be in the program. And we know that certain people are working, they go to school, they have other lives. And as we get into talking about recovery, those are critical parts of getting better. And there is no one size that fits all. We know that. So we really need to look at each patient, try to individualize treatment, try to see where they are. What are they, it's not just what we want. It's, and I, I really, it can be upsetting for me when I hear somebody say, well, this is the way I did it. This is the way you have to do it. Well, that's just not true. We have scientific-based treatments. What worked for somebody in this audience may not work for somebody else. We have to be culturally sensitive and really attuned to what each individual needs. And that's our job as clinicians, to try to help figure that out. We're not always gonna get it right the first time, but we're n we do know that doing it just one way is a problem. Somebody had talked about stigma before. I think before we can get fight stigma in the community, we have to fight it within our own substance abuse treatment com community. We still have people that are denying that evidence-based treatments are effective. Um, so we know that for opiate dependence, methadone and buprenorphine are effective treatments. There's a, a ton of science on it, and yet I still have patients that say that, you know, this person or that person or this program won't accept me because I'm on medications. Um, I think that's an individual decision between a patient and his physician. It's not for everybody, but we need to understand that some people need different things than other people. Again, there's a other couple other issues I just wanted to talk about real quickly before we open it up for questions. One is, again, motivational interviewing, stages of change. Everybody's at a different stage. Uh, if, if you haven't read about it, it's actually a nice concept to, to think about. Some people are pre-contemplative when we meet them. That means they're not even thinking about treatment. Some people are thinking about treatment, call contemplative. Some people are ready for action. Some people are in you know, the maintenance phase where they've already figured it out. Our job is not to go from stage one to stage four. I mean, if you think you're gonna go into the, um, meet with somebody that's actively using, that's pre-contemplative and have him turn around and say, thank you, you've helped me see the light. <laughs> we, we know that's probably not gonna be the case, but if we can leave the room and see that they're thinking, well, maybe I'll think about getting treatment. That's a success, and I think that's kind of what we need to do is sort of push people towards uh, recovery. It, sometimes it's a long process. Um, 
You know, every once in a while, somebody will have an eye-opening experience, they'll have a car accident, they'll be diagnosed with a serious illness, and that'll sort of shake them out of it. But in general, that's not what we see. And I know we have some of our peer recovery coaches here in, from the emergency room, and they probably see that every day. Um, and they see people that come back and come back. Um, Another thing that I find it's very important that we, we're working toward but we don't have um, is immediate access to treatment. I think that's just a huge issue for us. Um, we're working on things like in the emergency room, being able to people start people on medication, assisted treatment in the ER. Because when you think about it, if somebody's, let's take heroin for example, if somebody's using heroin six or eight times a day and you give an appointment in four days, I mean the guy, could be somewhere in East Baltimore, or you could be anywhere trying to chase those drugs. If, you, if he says, I'm ready for treatment now, hey, he may not be, but we gotta give him a chance, and we have to be able to open the door so people can have immediate access to treatment. Maryland's working on that. We're not there, um, but, but that, I think that's a really important thing. Um, so the, I talked about the medication issue. I think we need to come together and understand there is not one way, I'm repeating myself, that medications can be an important component for recovery for not only people with alcohol use disorders, but with opiate use disorders. Even Hazleton, that was the initial abstinence-based treatment program, has now uh, switched over and said people can be in recovery if they're taking medications. Um, being on a medication does not mean you're addicted to another drug. Addiction is the behaviors that are related to chasing a drug. So if you're preoccupied with finding cocaine 24 hours a day and it dominates your life, that's addiction. If you're taking a medication like buprenorphine once a day and you're able to work and take care of your family and not think about drugs, that's not addiction. Not in my mind, anyway. Um, the last thing I would just want to talk about it with treatment was, is harm reduction. So this is another very controversial um, topic. Some people believe it's abstinence or bust. Um, I think we're in the process of, of understanding that that's not always going to be the case, that sometimes we're going to see people that want to just reduce consumption. And there's some literature that that can be effective with certain types of people that drink, um, that they can, are able to reduce their drinking to a level that allows them to function and not engage in risky behavior. Um, so I, I think we need to be patient with patients. I, there's, a, there's a thought sometimes in treatment programs that I've seen that if you don't get it right right away, they kick you out of treatment. I mean, what other, there's no other medical condition when somebody's doing poorly that we kick them out of treatment. If you're a diabetic and you have you go off your diet and stop your medications and your blood sugar goes up to 400, they don't say, well, you can't come back, you're out. You know, they work with you, they counsel you, they try to, to improve their treatment intervention. But with, in substance abuse, it happens. You test positive, you're gone. And um, I don't think that's a really uh, accurate way of dealing with patients that have a medical illness um, and a brain that's been impacted by years and years of drug use. Other, um, so it was interesting, a couple years ago we went to Amsterdam to visit um, and see what they were doing in Holland because they're a little bit more progressive. I mean, some people may not agree with what they're doing, but we visited a safe consumption site, which they're talking about now and having in the United States. And you know, a lot of people would say, well, that's just enabling people to use. Um, we, you could argue about that, but the, the, the way they see it is very different. They see that these people are using this allows us to have them use in a safe place where, where it's not impacting the community, where we can prevent overdose. They've never had one overdose death in a, a safe consumption site. And the goal is in those sites is that you're trying to work on getting somebody into treatment, that they're not giving up on the person. The goal is, yeah, we don't want this to be this way. We want you to get help and treatment. Um, and so that, that's another thing that we're talking about in this country. Right now, we don't have any I think there may be one in Seattle, but and they're talking about having one in Baltimore, but again, you bring that up, it causes all sorts of controversy and, and people get upset. So in talking about recovery, so I think we're pretty good at treatment. We have an idea, we wanna get people in, we wanna get them to reduce or stop their drug use. Um, but I think, and again, for the people here in recovery, they can speak to this um, as well, that's not enough. 
that, that's the beginning. So um, my experience in, wa in, in working in the field is there are a group of people that when they stop using, they just kind of get it. They, they get a job, they're workers, and they get back and re-engage with their family and, and things go, you know, you don't hear from them much other than when they come and see and say they're doing okay. But there's another large group of patients that that doesn't happen for. So three months in, they may not be using, but they still may have medical problems, they may have mental health problems, they may not have a stable place to live, they may not have a job, they may not be connected to the community. And so they're still struggling with a lot of issues that could be triggers for them to start using again. And I've heard people actually say to me, you know, I'm clean, I'm not using anymore, so what? You know, what, what, what's next for me? So I think um, what's happened is we've started to take a broader look at what recovery really is. It's not just abstinence. Um, and we know, again, that some people that are abstinent are not in recovery. Um, they're two different things. They may not be using, but they may not have their life together as well. So recovery, and I'm gonna go through some of the slides now, um, is, de is defined by SAMHSA as a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. So this is something we do sort of in the maintenance phase when people aren't using. What do you, you know, it, it, this discussion should be not just about drug use anymore. It should be about what, what are you doing with your life? How do you, how do you spend your free time? These, these, where do you live? How you, are you reconnecting with your family? Are you taking care of your children? Those are all like huge parts of recovery. Um, and there are four dimensions of recovery. It's defined by Santa health, home, purpose, and community. So it's amazing when we see people that are just getting well, um, what they notice about their health. Um, so I, just one typical example is dental health. So we have a lot of patients that come in and all of a sudden they think the treatments are causing all their dental problems when they probably haven't been to a dentist in like 10 years and they haven't flossed their teeth in 10 years. So I, I think people start to notice. They notice they, they start getting tested for infectious diseases like hepatitis and HIV. Um, so health is a huge problem for these patients. We need to get them connected to medical care and also to mental health care. Many of our patients, especially in this area, have been traumatized by, you know, there's sexual trauma, there's violence uh, that a lot of our patients have experienced. A lot of our patients have experienced extreme losses. Um, it's amazing to me to see the resilience that many of our patients have, that you talk to somebody and they've lost more than one child, they've, they've lost spouses, and to be able to overcome that is quite tr challenging. Um, so we talked a little bit about that. Then home, I mean, this seems pretty simplistic, but it's amazing, again, especially for our peer recovery coaches that work in the ED, that how many people we see that don't have a place to live. And to get well without having a place to live is not easy. Um, so, and there seems to be a lack of empathy, even among healthcare providers about that. So we have people coming into the emergency department. I, I have lots of residents and physicians that will say, well, the guy's here just because he's homeless. Well, that's an important thing. It may not be a reason to come to the emergency room, but it, it's a critical aspect of somebody's life. I, I just say, well, have you ever not had a place to live? I mean, or a place to stay at night? And so try to have them think about what the ramifications of that are. The purpose, so I think there's more, again, it's more than just stopping drugs. What are people gonna do with their lives? And it doesn't mean they need to become professionals, uh, but a lot of people reconnect with their families. They take care of loved ones. They watch their children. They take care of an elderly relative. But these are important, meaningful activities that ha give people purpose and meaning in life and that are really important for uh, someone's self-worth and recovery. And then the community, reconnecting with, um, you know, AA is a, or 12-step programs are a great place and great way to reconnect with the community. Sometimes I think that's um, one of the most important aspects of the 12-step programs is providing a social base for people, uh, uh, being around people that don't use. But also there's churches um, and, or your job. Uh, there's all sorts of ways that people can reconnect with the community. And then, um, 
SAMHSA also came up with 10 guiding principles for recovery um, that the people that were hopeful that people can get better. I was actually talking to somebody the other day um, about am, am I hopeful? And I am hopeful that we can get our way out of this because I see people at the grassroots level get better. I think the best way for us to, Dr. Welsh, who's, who came back and I have talked about this, the best way to educate trainees and clinicians is to actually talk to people with addiction that are in that are doing well. I think that's because I think we people still see people as addicts and not human beings and when you get to know people they're just like you or me they have the same wishes and wants and desires they want to be able to have relationships and meaningful work and when you see somebody doing well it's just it, that's what convinces me and makes me hopeful that if we get our ducks in order that we can really make a difference in this epidemic um, let me go back here so then we talked about there are many pathways. It's individually driven, as we spoke about before, not us mandating this is the way it has to be done because that's the way our program's set up. That, or it's, that's the way I did it. That, that's the one that gets me the most. This is the way I did it so that you have to do it the same way. We use peers um, to help sort of support our um, patients now. They can share their experiences and help them walk through the process. I think having recreational uh, is, is mentioned, but I saw, where do you go? Where do you have fun? Where do you hang out? Um, we've actually talked about trying to have that, those kind of facilities in our own programs. Um, I was talking to an old uh, patient of mine today who goes down to the Senior Citizen Center and he plays pool with his buddies. I mean, he's got a place to go. These, these are important things. And w that we address trauma is really critical, as, we, as I mentioned before, that we have a large amount of our patients have experienced significant trauma over the years, and we just respect our patients as individuals, and I think that will give them a better chance of achieving a meaningful recovery. That's really pretty much what I had, so I don't know if anybody had any questions. Thank you. Let's sit down. Dr. Weintraub, I'd like to thank you for your service. My name is Garrett. I'm a peer recovery coach across the street in the emergency room. And, um, <laughs> and I have to share this with you. Um, coming in, I was one of the guys abstinence or bust when I came into this process. That's what I did. You know, and Dr. Weintraub and everybody, well, there's different ways. <laughs> so it's, it's been a year now, and I've seen it come to light. So now I'm open-minded with this new thing for me. You know, um, I've been clean a little over 10 years. Um, a young lady came in yesterday. I want to share this with you guys real quickly. She had been in the emergency room over 100 times since January. She came in, and what we like to think as a peer recovery coach is we just like simply plant and seed when they come in. Hey, how you doing? Are you ready today? No, I'm not ready today. So over the hundred times of her coming in, we planted a lot of seeds. So you're she was finally ready. You're telling a great story. Yeah. I want you to face the mic so that our satellite okay. locations will hear you. Hello, satellite. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she came in after four months of being clean, and she wrecked the emergency room. Everybody was just, wow! I mean, they were just taken aback, because this woman came in, the, the, I, she knew all of the ambulance drivers. They were coming up, hey, how you doing? It was just such a beautiful thing. And she was the one that, you know, just couldn't stop. You know, we got us, you know, some boxing or whatever. Now she's abstinent, you know. So it's like, wow. So today I'm open-minded. You can come in 100 times. You can come in 150 times. I'm going to treat you like it's your first time. Because um, it took me about 100 times before the life finally came on for me. So with that being said, thank you, Doc. Sure. Thank you, Gary, for sharing that. Hello. I wanted to say thank you for uh, not just the information, but your compassion is palpable. Absolutely. So your, your, your care for the human being. I'm one of those people that also believes that you have to deal with the whole person. You can't just deal with what they're manifesting or what their particular challenge or issue might be. So, um, you know, definitely I appreciate that and, and how you presented that. Um, one of the things that I think we face though when we talk about, uh, particularly with substance abuse, 
Uh, and, and to me, it's kind of, there's still a value-based judgment attached to that. You, you talk about someone who perhaps has diabetes and how that person doesn't necessarily go through the same um, perception that someone who has a substance abuse issue or challenge or disease might have or disorder might have. Because I think at some level, we still ascribe responsibility for that to that person. So we say, well, you could if you wanted to, when in fact, a lot of the data that's being presented says no, they can't. So at some level, it, it, we have to, as, as whatever, as clinicians, as counselors, whatever our role is, and whatever environment we're in, we have to take responsibility for how we're perceiving, not just putting everything, the onus on the person, because if we're truly caring about them, then we want to, them to be whole, and we're giving what we have to make them that way, rather than blaming them for their condition. Um, so I guess in my, the question that I would have for you is as you go through your processes of treatment and relating to patients, do you, uh, and it sounds like you do, but I don't want to presume, do you educate and do you teach holistically or do you more or less case by case, let's talk about the living circumstance. Um, the other point is all things being equal, what you're saying is perfect, but it still goes back to an issue that was raised earlier, which is access. Um, because on every level of this, regardless of what person walks in the door, the question that has to be asked is, not only is there a service or a support system, but do they have access and how are those things being addressed in, uh, globally? Globally, thank you. Yeah, well thank you for those comments. So I, I, there were, I got three uh, different responses. One is I was trained to uh, see patients or treat patients with a biopsychosocial model. It was a uh, kind of a approach that's been popular for many years. I don't know if we still see it that way. So I know that just treating an illness uh, without looking at the psychosocial issues is not going to be effective. So that's kind of the initial way I see somebody and talk to them and, and try to, now clearly access to resources is a problem. I don't have um, housing to give to people. I mean, and I can refer them to resources, but I know, that, I know those things are critical, that not being able to have a place to live or food or support, and sometimes that gradually comes um, at, with recovery as people rebuild their lives, but sometimes people need that uh, right away. Um, so. I think we probably need to do a better job of um, integrating all of our resources, and, um, and so that, that's, and I don't have the immediate answer to that. That's something we're always thinking about. Um, the stigma part, I think, is something that we work with every day, and we work with that with, when, I think more on the clinical side almost as much. I found that even within uh, certain pharmacists, certain providers within our own institution that people have these feelings about um, <coughs> substance, people that use substances and uh, they're frustrated. Um, and I think one of the reasons I've always thought was they don't see people get better sometimes. So I'll give you an example in the emergency room as Garrett was saying, he, they've seen that same person a hundred times. I get to see people get better so I'm more hopeful and optimistic so when they, I think it was great that they got to see this person come back in. But it's, it, this is gonna be a, a constant, um, I don't know if battle's the right word, but we have to be out there advocating and educating people. And I don't think it's gonna turn around uh, immediately, but I think we're slowly and gradually making proce progress. And it can be frustrating. Even for me, sometimes it's discouraging when I hear certain things and from the same people. Um, so it, we just gotta stick together and keep, um, telling people can get better and be optimistic about our patients. We have a couple of questions from Prince George's County. One is, are traditional programs like AA and NA good models to address today's crisis? I, I think NA and AA do a lot of really good things. Um, and I think it's, it's like, I hear people say this term now, tool in the toolbox. I don't think by itself it's a good treatment for uh, opiate dependence without other tools. Uh, I think it's been pretty clearly shown that the majority of people with opiate dependence do better 
or medications. Um, but I think NAA are great for, um, for great treatment. Certain people do well with that alone, depending on what their problem is. For some people, it's a great adjunct. Like, I think it's a great um, way of socializing for people in recovery. So if you have somebody that's been using every day for 10 years and they quit on Thursday, what are they going to do on Friday night? Because uh, all their friends use. So you go to an AA meeting, you start connecting with other people and getting sponsors. So I think it has a, has a place, but it's not a sole way of, of treat, treating our way out of the epidemic. There's a second question here that says, some community providers state that they're seeing growth in the new addictions among their patient population, such as K2, which we talked about earlier, and counselors are not sure how to manage them. So is there exploration of new evidence-based models that can be used in the community settings for ongoing support, such as we see with chronic diseases and self-management, or to effectively educate individuals, families, community providers on how to recognize and address risk factors related to the opioid and other new addictions? That's a pretty broad question. <laughs> so <laughs> we started with K2. So, so K2 is an issue. Uh, we, you know, I'm not sure what the actual question was about that. So Wait, one was just how do you manage people with these new addictions? And then what evidence-based models are out there to help? Well, so we're trying to, we're, we are just um, finding out about K2. K2 so there's a lot of new synthetic cannabinoids that are out there. They're all a little bit different. Uh, I work in the psychiatric emergency room, so I see the end result of people using cannabinoids and becoming psychotic and agitated. Um, I don't think there's really um, evidence-based treatment programs just for K2 treatment. We're just trying to even I, right at this point identify what they do, how they work, and wi which ones are the ones that are causing some of these problems. As far as we do have evidence-based practices for the treatment of opioid addiction, which include medi which is medication-assisted treatment, and which is a combination of medications, methadone, buprenorphine, or, and naltrexone with psychosocial um, interventions. So we have pretty solid evidence that this works. The primary um, outcome measures are decreased opiate use and increased engagement in treatment. And we also see decreased uh, transmission of uh, infectious diseases, decreased criminal activity, decreased overdoses. So yeah, we do have, I mean, that, that is the evidence-based treatment for opiate dependence. And we're trying to find out new, new medications. People are working on vaccines, but right now, those are the three FDA-approved medications. Good, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Digna, how you doing? Hi, Dr. Glenn. They see that we can get these. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner, mental health, and I work at the uh, Department of Juvenile Services for eight years. I retired now, and I work at uh, Central Booking. My challenge has been with um, nine out of ten people that I see they have uh, addiction, police substance addiction, and they come to me for mental health assessment. And I know that uh, BSAC and um, uh, Baltimore Mental Health System uh, unified over a year ago. I just don't see uh, the sphere of services for both, you know, people with um, dual diagnosis and, you know, addiction and mental health. I haven't seen it because in both facilities, they are treated separate. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just, I'm challenged with nine out of 10 people, nine out of 10 inmates that I see, um, they are po police substance abuser, and I'm not treating addiction. I'm trying to treat mental health, but I'm faced with a challenge that sometimes I don't know what I'm really doing. Mm -hmm. Can you speak about the effect of the uh, unification of uh, both the mental health system and uh, BSAC? Um, well, I, th I can speak probably better to the general question that there, there is a lot of comorbidity um, between substance abuse and addiction, and we know that in the jails they're not offering um, a lot of medication-assisted treatment unless you've already been started on it. So, um, we try, so we try to integrate treatments within our programs uh, where I can, I'm a psychiatrist and we have other psychiatrists working in our program so they can provide both mental health 
and addiction services. And I think by taking the addiction component out, it's easier to know what mental health issues are there. Um, so when somebody presents and they're in withdrawal and they've just been actively using, over 90% are gonna present with mental health complaints. But many of those patients, if you can treat their underlying addiction, will not have a pre-existing major mental disorder. So I think we do really need to integrate treatment. Um, I can't really speak to the politics of the combined, um, the combining of Baltimore City's programs and how that's impacted. Um, so I'm, I, I don't know where to go with that one, okay. Thanks, Dr. Weintraub. I appreciate like kind of, of course, what you're saying and I think that the, com the discussion has certainly has a lot of components, um, particularly what the previous good nurse practitioner has said, and then um, other comments regarding, uh, you know, the stigma, also in the access to care, and uh, sort of really what I see is the kind of great divide between uh, mental health and addiction, which really <coughs> needs to be, well, I guess I'm putting my own, which really need to be treated together, and I, I think that you also support that idea. And you also mentioned, you know, this idea of, several have mentioned the idea of access to care, and you've said, you know, you really think that um, care should start ideally, at, you know, kind of at the emergency room. Um, and I know that that's uh, really what you can do is working, you know, in the <coughs> psych ER, or the ER, and you have a psych ER across the street. So I was wondering how you think we as providers and, and you also sort of as a, uh, well, as a, you know, physician and, and in teaching, well, yeah, I, I guess you don't have, do, are you a medical, yeah. do you work at the School of Medicine? Yes, I do. So as a, you know, as a professor can really help uh, students learn and also, you know, other, other doctors kind of help <laughs> with education to them, to, uh, you know, your, your coworkers and colleagues, and also uh, for other providers and practitioners in terms of educating them to reduce the stigma that we can, uh, so that when we are treating uh, and, and interacting with um, substance abusers, that we can, uh, without bias and, and supportively, uh, help direct them to treatment, because I know that I've, uh, seen a lot of practitioners, uh, doctors, and other providers sort of um, really perpetuate the stigma. And, you know, when even in mental health providers, I've seen them, you know, if someone's doctor shopping, um, we, as, we as clinicians really should be, have adequate uh, skills and also uh, resources, you know, to refer them because this is a disease. And if we aren't referring them, then we are ignoring a medical condition. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this happen. Um, so, and I've also talked to lots of patients who feel that, you know, not only mental health providers, but other regular providers are treating them um, in a way that makes them feel very, very stigmatized and uh, uh, sort of ridiculed about, about their substance, um, their substance abuse. Okay. Yeah, so I think we're, we're um, there's several ways we can address that. One is through the school, the uh, professional schools. Um, we work with medical students and residents and trying to educate them about addiction and talk about stigma. Uh, Baltimore City, we actually have a, a very good program with, with the emergency rooms in which I think six of our emergency rooms now have peer recovery coaches. And we've also been able to institute um, initiation of buprenorphine treatment in the emergency rooms as well. And part of the process of getting that off the ground was going to the different emergency rooms and talking to their physicians and kind of dealing with some of the issues that you're talking about with them saying possibly, well, this is just gonna bring all these drug addicts to the emergency room. And we were talking about, well, if you don't treat the underlying addiction, they're gonna keep coming anyway with abscesses and different medical problems. So um, there's a lot of both education that needs to be done on the, um, in the classroom uh, and in the clinical settings because I think people have to see people get better and I think that's really important. 
I, I, again, I don't want to call on our peer recovery coaches, but I know they've pro their relationship probably with the emergency room has evolved over the one year that they've been there, that we kind of just stuck them in the emergency room and said, here they are. And um, I think now they're considered valu valuable members of the team and the nurses in the e emergency room. I, I used to, we used to kind of protect them, the psychiatric emergency room. They would come back to us for, I think we were the safe zone, but I think now they're, again, you can speak to it more than I can. They're accepted and considered a valuable part of the team. So it, it's a constant um, educational, uh, we got to keep educating our clinicians that this is a chronic illness and people can get better. And if we don't, if we ignore it, then they're just going to keep coming back to the emergency room. Chronic illness. So we have a question out of St. Joseph's Hospital, mm -hmm. which is how long are people expected to take buprenorphine and are there long term effects? Um, I think they sh need to take it as long as it's effective and. You know, you have a collaboration with your physician, so it could be um, for years. It could be, you know, de depending on what they, how they feel, if they want to work with their physician on coming off of it. But we don't t set a time frame on it. It would be no different than for me taking high blood pressure medicine or diabetic medications. People take it as long as they need it. Um, we don't know of any long-term negative effects of taking opioids um, when, you, when you're major organ systems. So it could be a lifelong treatment, if that's sort of the question. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you so much. Um, something that you said while you were speaking was really refreshing. And as someone in recovery and someone that works in the substance abuse treatment, you know, you said that doctors in the medical field should have open dialogue with people that are getting better. Um, but, you know, I've kind of had some barriers with that. So I just, you know, I know peer recovery in the emergency room has been really important, but what are some of your suggestions for opening that dialogue, both with people, you know, like myself that are in recovery, um, long-term recovery, and also, you know, someone that works in the substance abuse treatment field? Um, you know, how can we open this dialogue with the medical field? Uh, can you, wait, wait a minute, go, go away. <laughs> so specifically, can you talk about a, a particular barrier that you might have, so, so that means you as a, a patient or a clinician trying to talk to a physician about treatment? So what you, mostly on a personal note, like what you said was talking, it's important for the medical field and doctors to talk to people um, that are in recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I, as someone in recovery, open that dialogue with, you know, a doctor and come to them and say, you know, this was my experience, this is what happened. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I do, on a professional level, community outreach. So, you know, on another note, like how can I open a dialogue with you know, people like yourself or other doctors that, you know, kind of believe that we have something to offer to this. And, you know, how can we open that dialogue? Yeah, I'm not sure I had the, the answer. I know there are, so there's been an, ex an extreme, uh, an enormous expansion in the utilization of peer recovery um, specialists, coaches. Um, so there, one way would be to guess, I guess, get into the field and have interactions in that way um, because you would be working with physicians. As far as more of a open dialogue in an educational setting, I'm not sure um, I have the answer to that, but it's probably something good to think about and to figure out a way where we could have that communicate. Hard to get docs out of their offices sometimes, so. Dr. Weintraub, someone said earlier, thank you for your compassion. It is palpable, and I've worked with you a long time, and it is clear from your work and from your words how you feel about this and how much you really care about your patients, and we thank you for your presentation and for that compassion as well. A few minutes ago, Dr. Weintraub used the term hope when he was standing here at the podium, and we have something that I think is very, very special, and if this isn't a good story for hope, I'm not sure what is. We have Dr. Jason Ramirez back here who is going to come to speak to you. He is a, an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine here at the School of Medicine. He grew up the child of two addicted parents, and he is here to share his story. I promised you a present as well later, He's written a book which is called The Hard Way, A Doctor's Fight Against Addiction, Poverty, and Depression. When you turn in your evaluations, and I know you will, 
you will get an autographed copy of his book uh, today. So Dr. Ramirez, please come. Uh, his story is very personal, very honest, and very real. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, so when I first got asked to, to come talk, I didn't know actually how to respond. My first thought was, well, why do you want me to come talk? You got all these wonderful people that talk about great things, and I'm just me. Um, then I realized, well, I wrote a book about it. I can't hide it anymore. Um, it's a story that I wanted to share for a simple reason, to try and give hope and inspiration to people who may be having struggles with life. Um, my initial reservations were, well, everybody has struggles with life. I don't know anybody who doesn't struggle with life in some way, shape, or form. Um, but then I realized there are things in my life that, that changed the way I thought of things and, and allowed me to become who I am today. So, you know, who am I? Yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm a, I got this badge. It, it, it says I'm a doctor. Wow, I, that's pretty cool. Um, I am the residency program director for the Department of Family Medicine, which means I'm in charge of training the, the, re the residents to becoming young family doctors. It's pretty cool. They, some people tease me and say I'm the boss. I don't know if I like that, but because people usually don't like their boss. But that's not how it started. That's not who I am. Yes, I, I have a nice home. I have a, a nice car. I have a beautiful wife and two kids. Um, but that's not how it started out. Um, you know, I, as far as I can remember, and, and you know, five, five years old, um, I did. I grew up in a household of, of addiction. My parents, both of them, were heroin addicts. Um, and so I, but I didn't know. Who, when, you're, when you're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, what do you know? You see, you see random people coming over your house, kind of all fidgety, anxious. They go into your parents' bedroom. They come out 15, 20 minutes later, and they're really sleepy. I didn't know what was going on. thought my parents were pretty popular. They had a lot of people coming over. Um, then I realized, well, that's something else is going on. You know, why, why sometimes people come out of the room, sometimes people are dragged out of the room, thrown into a bathtub, water running on them, my mom slapping them to try and get them to wake up. Um, there were a few people that did not wake up. Um, unfortunately, got to witness that as a young child. Um, you know, why, why was my father in prison a lot? Um, why was my mother always having this stereotypical nodding, intent, trying, to tend, trying to slowly scratch her face, a lot of times missing? Why was my father a lot of times not playing with me? Instead, he's on the floor, face planted down, always sleeping. I didn't, I didn't understand these things until I got to be a little bit older. Um, and how older, I'm talking about eight, nine years old. And, you know, but then the, the whys kept asking. I ask why a lot. I still do. But why, you know, why would my mom want to tie a shoelace around her arm? Why would my father hold a spoon and my mother light a, uh, a lighter under it and have this weird substance boiling? Why would they want to stick what I thought was a very big needle, because I'm a little kid, um, in their arm? I, I just don't get it. But they said, oh, don't worry about it. So I didn't worry about it too much until it started to impacting us. You know, I was eight when my first sister was born. I'm one of four children. I'm the oldest and the only boy. Um, and I became a parent very quickly. My parents were not capable. That, you know, they weren't bad parents. Uh, I'll stress that a lot. I'll get to that at the end. They weren't bad parents, but they had struggles. And they had, to them, maybe priorities. That may be a strong word. But um, they tasked me a lot with the responsibility of caring for my, for my siblings. And again, it started at eight. So yes, what eight, nine-year-olds left alone with a newborn? Well, that, that was me. Um, you know, from cooking to cleaning to bathing, um, that's, that became my responsibility really, really quickly. And then the second and then the third sibling came, um, impacted me socially. You know, I, I didn't do anything as a teenager. You know, I didn't, my summer vacation, I, I did not like summer vacations. Summer vacations meant 24-7 at the house with the kids. Um, loved my sisters, but still, I wanted to be a kid uh, and just didn't have that opportunity. Never got a chance to play sports, never got a chance to do anything. 
um, other than, than raise the, the three sisters that I have. Um, the funny thing is one, when I left for college, I was seven, 17, about to be 18, um, I thought that I was leaving it all behind. I was like, I done, I put in my time. Um, you know, I, I struggled, and I, but I got through it. I raised my, they were, they were raised, they were so small. But I uh, did my part to help raise my sisters, and I thought, okay, I can move on and live my life. Um, and I did for a while. Um, read a book that changed the direction of my life, an autobiography, which really was kind of my impetus to say, okay, maybe I can do it too. But um, when I left, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. I've done everything on my own in life. I'm going to become a doctor, and because I'm, I, I really believe I can help people in a, in a, a way that, you know, is very special. And I wanted to be a surgeon at first. Okay, I make mistakes too. Don't hey. Um, some people got that. Uh, I thought that was really funny, actually. <laughs> so sorry if there are any surgeons out there. Um, but it caught up with me. You know, I lived a childhood feeling that I didn't need anybody. I was doing everything on my own. Um, I didn't have much parental guidance. They didn't push education. They didn't push anything. They just kind of did their thing, and I did my thing. Um, but it caught up in, in the form of I started all of a sudden sleeping a lot. Um, grades started dropping. Uh, again, couldn't get out of bed, don't go to class, turn, translates into, you know, not doing too well. Fortunately, I was able to snap in and out of it, in and out of it. I keep going in and out of these waves of, of what now I know is depression. Um, that doesn't go away. I still struggle today. You know, I have a great life, but I still have periods of time where, where depression creeps in. Um, but somehow, you know, I'd always get picked up. So life would knock you down, and it does. Um, many, many, many different quotes out there about, you know, it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up, and I really believe that. But life kept knocking me down, and for some, somehow, some way, and I don't know that I have the answers to, to always how I got up, but I would get up, and I would fight through um, and make, make something positive happen. But it wasn't without struggles. Um, you know, the times growing up, watching the kids, if that was all it was, my sisters, that wouldn't be so bad. Um, but it was the, okay, where are we gonna live now? I mean, I, I thought, man, my parents just liked moving a lot. We had apartment after apartment after apartment after apartment. It wasn't we liked moving, it was because we were getting evicted all the time, because we weren't paying the rent. So from apartment to grandmother's basement, to apartment to grandmother's basement, um, to worst, worst times were when I was 12, 13, it was our car, five of us in a car. Those were the pretty rough nights. We'd, we'd sleep in, in the car on a rest areas on I-95. We'd, I was born in Connecticut. We Parents really were running from, from the law uh, and decided to make an escape. It's in the book. Um, but we'd, we'd just stop at rest areas along I-95. My parents would, you know, it's very humbling when you're watching your parents begging for money. Um, my mother was very, very convincing. Um, and you know, we, we did that all the way down. It took a two month uh, period of time to get from Connecticut to Florida, but we would just stop, panhandle, whatever that we call it now, ask for money, go find whatever uh, major city we were close to, go get their heroin, and then at night we'd try and find a homeless shelter. If we didn't find a homeless shelter, that became our car. Um, I actually preferred the car. Homeless shelters to me were always very intimidating and scary as a, as a young child. Um, big auditoriums, hard gymnasium floors. Sometimes you got a cot, most of the time not. Um, but, you know, those, those are the times that, that really stuck with you. And, and it didn't end when I left. When depression got hold, I ended up, I'm a doctor, I'm a, I'm a surgical trainee, 
and I couldn't, again, start it. My father passed away uh, right before I graduated medical school. He contracted hepatitis C from IV drug use, also drank very heavily. So those two don't go together very well from the liver standpoint. And he passed away. And I really spun into a major depression where I could not get out of bed. My job thought, well, what's the matter? You must be using drugs. I'm like, well, the irony of this whole thing is that I'm not. But, um, and I didn't, I, I don't know if I didn't have the insight or what it was. I didn't know what, why I couldn't get up out of bed, why I couldn't show up to work. But, you know, if any of us don't show up to work, you're not going to have that job very long. So I got, well, asked to resign, and I resigned, um, but basically didn't have a choice. And so now I'm an unemployed doctor living out of my car, because um, that's all I knew. <laughs> I knew how to do that. Now that, that was taught to me, but I didn't know what else I was going to do. Um, fortunately, I was able to get back into medicine, um, family medicine, which I always say family medicine kind of found me uh, more than I found family medicine. It's the best thing that's really ever happened uh, from, from a personal and, and professional standpoint. Um, but I still had a large chip on my shoulder. <laughs> it wasn't and I probably still do if you ask my wife. Um, but I just, thank you for a, a couple chuckles there. <laughs> That's nice, um, but, but unfortunately true. Um, but it was still rough because I still felt like, okay, I didn't need anybody to succeed. I still thought, oh, I was doing all this on my own. You know, it took me 44 years or however long it's been. I'm, 44 now, but it took me the, to, some time to realize, and maybe it was writing the book, I don't know, but reflecting back at the past and thinking, you know, I did not do it myself. You know, which poses the question, well, how did you do it? I've been asked that, well, how did you do it? I don't know, I don't have the answer to that. I do believe certain things. I said before, my parents were not bad parents. They had, as we've heard all this morning, they had a disease, okay? They had a major disease that cost them their lives at a young age. I've been never without parents for over 15 years now. And again, I'm only 44. Um, I told you about my father. My mother, after being um, in recovery for a while, unfortunately, is, is we talked a little, this is nice, it's tying in a lot of stuff we talked about this morning, but had some problems with chronic headaches. Went to her family doctor who prescribed oxycodone, and that's all it took. She was back, um, addicted again, back to using, um, lost her, um, she got remarried, lost her husband because of it. I took her in, um, moved her into my house because she attempted suicide. Um, she didn't succeed the first time, she succeeded the second time. Um, the second time was by a bottle of medications that were prescribed by Dr. Jason Ramirez. I was trying to help her depression, help her headaches, help her insomnia, and I thought I was doing the right thing. She was a very wise woman. She knew what I was giving her. She had it in her mind what she was going to do. Somehow, that did not throw me into the major depression that you may think it would have. And it ties into, again, why I think I've been able to overcome a lot of things. Um, you know, why, why we talked about 50, 50 roughly genetics, environmental. Statistically, I suppose, you would think I had environmental, I had genetic, I had everything. You know, why I really believe it's not to sound cliche-ish, but a lot of who I become and how I've been able to get through things in life and how other people, speaking of parents, to two parents who have children, the parents who have addiction problems, again, sound however you want it to sound, but I, I really think it's based on love. My parents, I know for a fact, loved us and they tried shielding us. They didn't do a very good job, but they tried. and. They weren't there as much as they could have been, but they, they did instill in me anyway a 
family is paramount importance. We must love each other. We must support each other. And that's what I did for my sisters. And if I didn't have three sisters, I, I, I don't think I'd be standing up here talking about my story. I don't know what would have happened, but I dedicated my childhood to loving my sisters and raising my sisters. In adulthood, I, my struggles, again, overcame them purely based on, on, on the love of, of a young woman that is unfortunately not here. She's across the street working in the ER. Um, but my wife, who literally entered my apartment one day while I was in bed sleeping because I didn't want to face the world, plopped a bottle of antidepressants on the table wrote with a note saying, start taking this or we will no longer be. Now, if anybody's seen my wife, she's really, really, really hot. <laughs> so I took that bottle of medication that day and um, the rest is history, six to 17 years later. But, but I, it, it's, you know, it's, it's still an issue even today. I still have struggles. I still think about, you know, what my life has been, where I've come, um, where I'm going. I mean, I still have problems with, again, not, I can't talk about what it's like to be in, uh, be a, you know, a subs have a substance abuse disorder or what it's like to struggle with, with uh, addiction. But I know what it can do to, a, to a, the children, to the family, um, and you know what I'd encourage people to do in that either are seeing or counseling families is to remember that you know they for their at least for their themselves and their children's standpoint that if showing love to their family, their children, and putting that uh, above all else. Um, can make big differences, and then knowing that they can't, they don't have to do it alone. Um, you know, when I, I think it's when I realize that, you know, I, I need to get rid of this, I can do it myself mentality. I don't need anybody, I don't need anybody. Once I let go of that and accepted that, you know, there are people that care about you, and that's okay. Um, you can let people in. Uh, Still working on that a little bit, but you can let people in, and they can they can make you know they can show you that you're you're cared for and you're loved. It really makes a difference. Um, so I, I, you know, definitely try and instill that now in people that I see. Um, I don't share my story very personal story very often with with patients or anything, but I have on a, on a couple occasions. One one I'll share with you is because I think it was the most beautiful experience I've ever had with a patient. Um, long story short, she had been multiple, ad again, multiple admissions to the hospital, this undefined nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Nobody could figure it out. Million dollar workup, all the specialists you can do, all the procedures you can do, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. And she literally could not eat. I mean, this wasn't made up, this is real stuff. I mean, I would watch her vomit. She'd, try, she'd smell food and she'd, she'd throw up. And I came in the room, I sat down, and I'm like, what, you know, I don't understand what's going on. I know you have a, a, you know, a, a heroin abuse history. I know you're, um, you've battled that, but, you know, could the, and I knew it wasn't, because she had been in the hospital for like a month. I'm like, could, you know, could it be, what, are you withdrawing, what's going on? She's like, no, 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 that's not it. I'm like, look, I, I don't, I'm not gonna tell you I know what it's like to be in your shoes, but, and I shared my background, my family background, and, and you know, growing up in, in a home of addiction. And I kid you not, she sat up in her bed, gave me a hug, said, thank you for sharing my story. I'm hungry. Normally, if they're not taking anything by mouth, you like start with clears or something like that. No, I gave her the biggest tray of food I possibly could find, and she ate the whole thing, and I discharged her the next day. She was like, my fear was... I was afraid, I, I lost my connection to my Suboxone and I was fearful that I was gonna relapse and go back to heroin. And then all these symptoms came about and I came in the hospital. And it was simply sharing the story. She hasn't been in the hospital. She was in, ironically, my wife took care of her in the ER one time for something totally different. And, she, and this was a couple years later and she said, she recognized the, I think the name badge and she's like, your husband saved my life. And, and I, I was like, that, that's just, you know, give me chills right now. Um, but it's, it's, you know, that's the reason why 
I've chosen to continue to, to now start sharing my story, is that if I can help impact and imp give inspiration, hope um, to others, and it doesn't have to, I thought initially, oh, the youth, I wanna help the youth. It doesn't have to be, right? It, it could be anybody, it could be any one of us. Hopefully somebody in this room can be inspired um, by my story, and I'm not a, I'm nothing special. I mean, I'm just, I'm just Jason Ramirez. You know, grew up Bristol, Connecticut, as a youngster, Orlando, Florida, as a as a young man. Nothing special about me. I have all kinds of problems. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, but I honestly think I'm no different than anybody else. And you know, we all you know have to get through this life. And again, doing it together. Uh, is, is the way we can, we can do it. Um, thank you very much. So, very humble, would you say? Yes. Uh, it, you may not know it, but we know it. You are a rather, you, know, you are a very amazing human being. And we thank you very much for your story, for sharing. Wow, you just gave him chills, gave me chills. What a special, what a special person you are. And thank you very so much for sharing. You, you are going to help people. Absolutely, you are. Questions? Mm -hmm. I just want to ask, how is your sibling doing? So I prepped for that question because I figured that was going to be a question. Um, no, I didn't have to prep, but it's a great question, right? The four of us. 75% of us beat the odds, okay? So I have me, my oldest sister who's uh, doing well, she's a fitness instructor in Georgia, um, uh, living her life through faith and doing, you know, doing very well, no problems. My um, second sister is, who I just found out this week, is expecting her first child. So it's, it's exciting, I'm gonna be an uncle, which is awesome. Um, she's a, a she owns a dance studio, a Fred Astaire dance studio in Sarasota, Florida. So she competitively dances ballroom dance. I don't, she got all the dance genes. Okay, I have nothing. Trust me on that one. You don't want to see it. Um, my fourth, the youngest. Uh, right now, I'm pretty sure I should know for sure, but pretty sure still in jail, um, in and out of jail, in and out of uh, rehabs has has fallen. Um, uh, you know, kind of ill from time to time with addiction, and um, but last last I heard, she was in in a prison in Florida. Um, does don't really hear from her unless um, somebody from the law is looking for her or she wants you know wants money. Um, it's the times I've heard from her. Now, I mean, you can make what you want from that. I'm not going to say that I was the one who did anything, but I almost feel a little bit of guilt there because when I left, she was like home to go to college. She was two. And I, you know, I was there for the other two a little bit more, a little bit longer in their lives. And when I, when I left for college, I mean, I, I, I left. I never really went back. I assumed that my oldest sister would kind of take over and step into my shoes. She didn't. She actually ran away from home and went to people who said, hey, you want a room of your own? You want a TV in your room? You want a telephone? She was an impressionable young teenager, teenage girl. She left home um, and left my two young one, younger sisters behind. Um, that consequently cost us five years of not talking to each other. Uh, but we've, me and that, my oldest sister, we have long since made up and, and do talk from time to time. But um, yeah, that's where they are. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, I work at University of Maryland Alcohol and Drug Abuse Program, and I also work with a lot of youth in parenting class um, who suffer from depression and who come from parents of the same background. And besides medication, um, what are some coping skills that maybe younger children can use, you know, because we know medication is not just the answer. You still have to have, you know, coping skills and kind of 
sometimes I guess if you feel when you're going into that depression or things maybe that younger children can use to get out of it whose parents are still using. Right. Um, very good question. And this is something I never really knew about or even, um, even as an adult. You know, we all realize and, un and appreciate that medications alone versus therapy alone and then the combination is always better. Um, it's one we have to, as, as people who have battles with depression, I think we, this is where I struggled, was accepting that I have that problem. Um, I mean, it took a long, long time to realize that, okay, I, I, I have this problem. I can't do it on my own, and I need help. Um, and it's harder for children, I think, to kind of understand that. And that's where I think the, the you know, it's hard to say, but the home environment, the supporting environment has to, if it's there, it makes it a lot easier. The problem is most of the time it's not. And so how do you, you know, I don't know how you, I don't deal a lot with, in, with pediatric psycho psychology, uh, but how do you instill that there? I do think if you can get that message, if I can get the message out there that that is the most fundamental thing, if you care, I know you care about your kids. I know it. And I know you have a disease that's limiting you from being the, the optimal parent that you want to be. But, you know, showing that support, showing that love, being there for them, you know, reading to them, doing their homework, show, just playing with them. I have one memory only of me and my father doing anything together. And it was when uh, I was a teenager we played. He, that's because he bet some guys at work that we could beat him at two-on-two -two basketball. <laughs> we did. Um, but that's it. I, I don't remember any any... any true times that we, you know, I can say, okay, we bonded, and we did. and I'm, let me tell you, I have a seven-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter. I come home, and I don't care if it's up until 11 o'clock, I have to play with them. I don't do anything until they go to sleep, and then I'm up till one, two in the morning doing my work, but my, as best as I, I hope I can do the best I can, I will not have them going through childhood and being an adult and saying, oh, I have one memory of playing with my father. Um, I, I cannot, I love what I do, I love medicine, I love teaching, but I know where my heart is, and it's, it's with, those, with those three people that I go home to every night. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Dr. Ramirez, thank you again for sharing such a poignant story. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our formal program, but I want to invite you once again to visit all of the service providers who are outside uh, at their tables. And I also want to say an overall thank you to all of the speakers for today. And a special thank you to everyone who helped put today together our community benefit team, our IT team, our media folks. Um, your efforts are really very greatly appreciated. I hope you all will continue to join us. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is part of a now new series, uh, Not All Wounds Are Visible, a community conversation on X. We started today with um, addiction and substance abuse following the day long that we did some months ago. The next one will be on May 23rd here in the same location, and that one will be on depression and anxiety. So we hope you'll come back and join us again. I hope today has been beneficial to you. We do really do welcome your comments on those evaluations. Dr. Ramirez will be outside by his book table, and make sure you uh, turn those in and get a copy of the book on your exit. Thank you so much for joining us today.